Um, so once again, let me just give you the format of today. I'll be lecturing. Um, we won't have time for questions today. We will in the future, and I promise you that we will. Um, but we're still trying to get the enrollment business settled, so I'll need to take role once again uh, and deal with those issues in order to get us all out of here by two. Um, so let me just reiterate a couple of things about the um, sections this week. Most importantly, you must go to a section this week. You should go to your assigned section. If there's some reason that your schedule is still in flux and you can't do this, this week and this week only, you can go to another section, but please let the GSI to, which, to whom you are assigned know uh, so that they don't mark you absent and so you don't get inadvertently dropped. So uh, go to a section this week, um, and please, the preference is to go to your assigned section. Let me catch you up on where we are with enrollment. The good news is that um, we currently have 10 more spaces and the good news for some of you is that the um, undergraduate advisors in political science have convinced me to give priority to graduating seniors. Um, <laughs> I know that makes the graduating seniors really happy. Um, I, I, I fought it a little bit because, of course, for a teacher, it's always a pleasure to have students in class who just really, really want the class as opposed to, I'm desperate to graduate and I gotta have the class. Um, so you graduating seniors have to convert to that other mode and be people who really want to be here and, um, you know, give it your all. Um, I, there will be some room probably to accommodate a few others, but um, if you are a person who is already on the wait list and are a graduating senior, I can fairly reassure you, I think I have the current wait list, I'm not sure, um, that you will probably be able to be in the class. That will be established by the end of class today. I'll once again take roll. Um, see if there are any additional drops, and then move to um, tell those of you who I've already been able to add on the basis of having additional spaces that you're in, and if there are more spaces that issue from people who don't show up today, I'll let others in as well, okay? Um, does anyone have an urgent question about this right now because you may need to just hop up and go run to another class? Yes. Graduating this year, this year, you're safe. If, you, if there's a four after your name, and a couple of you signed my, my wait list and said you were a graduating senior, but there's a three after your name, I didn't include you. But if there's a four after your name, um, then, then you're a graduating senior, okay? And that doesn't mean others of you can't get in. I think I have a few others listed here as well, but that's, that's the status, okay. Can you, can you hang on until the end of class then for the rest? Okay. So. Um, you might want to, yes, you will want to get your books out, assuming you have them, um, for those of you who've already enrolled and are settled, because we will be doing some work in them. You can just kind of put them by your feet for the time being, but um, about halfway through we'll start looking at some specific pieces of text. A reminder that um, you won't be using electronics in here, uh, but there is one person who uh, demonstrated to me uh, that she had a serious wrist or nerve implication and she does have a computer open, so don't think she's just flagrantly violating the rules or uh, that some random exception has been made for her. Please don't, I want, don't want to see 30 of you coming in here with wrist bandages. <laughs> um, but obviously, you know, if you injure yourself in tennis or water polo or something like that and can't do anything but type with one hand, I'm of course going to make an exception, okay? But Let's not produce that en masse. Okay, so today what I'm going to do is introduce our first theorist, Alexis de Tocqueville, and then um, talk about his life a little bit. This will be my pattern with most of our, um, with all of our theorists, and then begin to work our way into the text and start seeing um, what the project of, of uh, Tocqueville's uh, Democracy in America is, as well as uh, start thinking about what he means by democracy and what it is about America that is so compelling to him. Let me just do a quick check. Can you hear me in the back? Yes? Okay. Um, and if you want to find a place to sit on the stairs, please do. If you'd rather hang out by the door, that's fine as well. Okay. And there's some window seats people have found. So. Okay. So. Um, Let's return to where we left off last time, which was Tocqueville's assertion that a new political science 
is needed for a world itself quite new. A new political science is needed for a world itself quite new. Tocqueville's assertion is figured in his own origins and life. He is one of these beings in a new world. What do I mean? Tocqueville was born to a noble family in France, but that nobility was formally, officially abolished by the French Revolution itself. So he is literally a figure from the Ancien Regime, the old regime, who comes into the world as a child with that regime eliminated and that noble status eliminated by the revolution itself. His father was a revolutionary sympathizer, but he expected that his own wealth and property and, and sort of pastoral intellectual way of life, his aristocratic standing, would remain untouched by the transformations brought by the revolution. And that, of course, was wrong. Both the property and the lives of the Tocqueville family were decimated, and Alexis's own childhood was a rather unsettled and somewhat traumatic one, leaving him, by his own account, rather melancholic for life. This background also perhaps formed his own rather complicated relationship to democracy. That is, Tocqueville himself believed that democracy was right, was inevitable, was what one had to stand with and for, and yet he also knew it was not without its losses, its absences, its, uh, it, 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 its abandoned uh, goods to some other place. In a way, Tocqueville's intellectual journey to America begins rather young. When he was 16, he encountered the skeptical writings of the Enlightenment in his father's library. And when he began reading those, it shattered his own youthful Catholic faith, and he became politicized. He was, as a, as a young adult, faced with a choice of either entering the Navy or entering the magistracy. And he indeed became a magistrate. He studied to be a lawyer. And at the same time, he became a political philosopher. He was an ardent reader, largely autodidactical. That is, he mostly taught himself political philosophy and history and other such things. But it's important to underscore that Tocqueville came from an educated class. And he really valued that origin. And the reason I'm underscoring this is that one of the things he's going to lament in American democracy is that it's not, it does not have, in his view, a strong and large educated class. His political reflections during the 1820s led him to embrace liberalism. And let me underscore again, by liberalism at this point, we mean a doctrine and a form of government that emphasizes individual liberty and political equality. Individual liberty and political equality. And I'll say much more about this later on in the class, but right now we need to throw out of our heads the idea that it's liberal, meaning left versus conservative, where everybody more or less embraces the idea of individual liberty and equality. Liberalism here really stands for the emphasis on universal political inclusion, political equality, everybody's treated the same way, at least officially, by the law, seen by the law as the same, and everyone has uh, individual rights or liberties. Tocqueville then was an, a figure who embraced liberalism as opposed to the old aristocratic regime, but his enthusiasm for the emancipatory aspects of liberalism were somewhat tempered by his distrust of revolutionary excess. And he shared this with a lot of other figures in his time. That is, many of them were very sobered by what happened at the very end of the French Revolution with the rise of what is called the terror and with the anxieties that this produced in all who were trying to build a settled, stable class without violence, without mob rule. Tocqueville half-heartedly endorsed the July Revolution of 1830, and that 
separated him from his more conservative friends and colleagues. But at that point, he requested and received permission from the French government to go with his friend, Gustave de Beaumont, to study American prison reforms. So he and Beaumont together wanted to go off to America to study the prison system and prison reform. At least that was the official story. From the beginning, Tocqueville tells us in other works, his real desire was to scrutinize this new democracy, to study all elements of American life in order to try to figure out something. And the something he wanted to figure out is, why did that democracy seem to be thriving? Why did the young American democracy seem to be both vital and very peaceful in a way that the French one was not. So Tocqueville went to America to try to figure out what was making American democracy work. Beaumont and Tocqueville arrived in America in 1830. And they spent nine months in a demanding and what was sometimes quite dangerous cross-country trek interviewing, witnessing, studying, hanging out in bars, hanging out with um, social groups, studying political institutions. They moved from the cities of the Northeast to the far edge of the Western frontier. They went from French Quebec to French New Orleans. Now, it's important to remember what time this was in the United States. It was a really heady, really tumultuous time, the heyday of Jacksonian democracy. So it featured the rise of abolitionism, but also the rise of machine politics. It featured a tremendous amount of religious revivalism. It also featured the massive displacement of Native Americans. And on that landscape as well, Tocqueville and Beaumont encountered political debates both at the level of government and in the populace. Political debates about a range of different kinds of policies and about federal finance and indeed debates that parallel some of ours today about the appropriate size and reach of government. So what do we have? At this time that Tocqueville and Beaumont are wandering about, Lots of agitation in the formal political sphere, but also ordinary citizens who are very engaged by politics, by political issues, very willing to debate, very willing to offer opinion. And as I said, they interviewed a large variety of people. They interviewed Jackson himself, as well as other politicians and statesmen, but they also interviewed hunted Native Americans, New England villagers, Southerners, and so forth. Tocqueville returns to France in 1832 and then spent several years immersing himself in American writings of various sorts, literature, political pamphlets, and so on. He also studied European political philosophy theories of democracy and institutions. And only after a couple of years of that was he ready to craft the book that you are reading now. So one thing we need to grasp here is that democracy in America emerges from a really unusual combination of sources. Interviews, what we would today call ethnography, that is a kind of anthropological study of American political life but also travel journals, political theory, American history, political writings, the Federalist Papers, and so forth. Tocqueville published the first volume of this two-volume work, and if you flip through it, you realize you have two volumes smashed into one big book here. He published the first volume in 1835, and he published the second volume five years later. The first volume immediately established him as 
a luminary of his age. It was an instant success. It launched Tocqueville's own political career in France. He served um, first as a legislator in the constitutional monarchy of Louis Philippe, and then very briefly as a foreign minister in the short-lived Second Republic um, that was established by the 1848 revolution. But by 1848, Tocqueville was pretty dispirited about the prospects for French democracy. Um, he, he gives you an assessment of that in another work that we're not reading called his recollections, just recollections, which he wrote in 1850. And by the time Napoleon stages his coup d'etat in 1852, Tocqueville was ready to leave politics for good, which he did. He hated Napoleon and thought French democracy at that point really had no good future. He spent the rest of his life after he left politics writing a marvelous work called The Old Regime and the Revolution. It's a very um, nuanced and subtle study of the French Revolution that is a kind of wonderful combination of history and political theory. He died of tuberculosis in 1859 without completing what was supposed to be the second volume of the old regime and the revolution. So that's Tocqueville's life. Again, remember, I'm never going to test you on this sort of thing. The reason for giving you the life, as you'll see in the case of each theorist, is it helps us get them situated, it helps us see the perspective th from which they are seeing, and it helps us understand some of the features of their work. It's not to reduce political theory to political psychology or political biography, but it's to let political theory be uh, illuminated in part by it. Okay, I'm turning to number two now. I want to talk a little bit about the project of democracy in America. There are lots of ways to read this work. You can read it as a kind of history or ethnography, one that gives us a window on what America in the time that it was being written was like, and a way that gives us a window on perhaps some of the differences between that America and this one, that democracy and our contemporary one. The second way to read it is as a kind of comparative work. That is, a comparative political analysis that features the differences between European and American forms of democracy. A third way to read it, and the way we'll really be emphasizing, is as political theory. What do I mean by that? This means reading the work as a text helping us to understand or giving us ways to consider what generates democratic institutions, democratic political culture, and democratic subjects, democratic individuals. So a text that helps us understand what generates democracy, what maintains it, what the tensions are in it, and what endangers it. Because all of that is in this work. This is what Tocqueville's concerned with. What makes democracy? What sustains it? What supports it? What pulls at it? What corrodes it? What undoes it? What supplements does it need? What are its, what are its dangerous turns? What, are, what, are, what, are, uh, what kinds of people must it cultivate in order to go on living. It's crucial to remember, as we read this text, that however much it, it, it reads as a kind of study of America, and indeed one of the most substantial tributes ever written to this country, Tocqueville's own purposes were largely French and more broadly European. And what I mean by that is what he emphasizes in the beginning and what I've emphasized already, what Tocqueville wanted to discern and theorize is what makes American democracy tick? What makes it work? But he wanted to discern and theorize that, not simply to emulate it, but to understand something about the very age of democracy, its possibilities and its perils, its needs and its conditions. 
even though he has more praise to heap on American democracy than any other institutionalized form of it at the time, even his appreciation of American democracy is ambivalent. Moreover, Tocqueville's too much of a cultural and social theorist. He's too deeply a historical and sociological thinker to believe that you could just import one model to another place. He really understands the kind of organic quality of political uh, forms and, and uh, of polities themselves. And so he's trying to get at what you can learn from the success of American democracy, the parts of it that, that, that um, contribute to that success, to then think about what it is that Europe might be able to do to better its own democracies, not to simply imitate. You can see this clearly in um, a preface that you don't have in, in this edition. It's the, it's the 1848 preface that he offers to the 12th edition of the book, and I'll just read to you. He says, let us not turn to America in order to slavishly copy the institutions she's fashioned for herself, but so that we may better understand what suits us. Let's look there to America for instruction rather than models. Let's adopt the principles rather than the details of her laws. The principles rather than the details of her laws. So that already tells you that a theoretical move is going to be made here. He's going to try to figure out something about the principles that are making American democracy work. So this text is framed by a belief that France and Europe more broadly could learn from America if it can grasp the principles of its success. And that requires a theoretical abstraction from the specifics of US institutions and history. It requires knowing the detail, but not being an empiricist, not just um, looking at things uh, and figuring out how to remake those institutions elsewhere. Another way of putting it is that what Tocqueville appreciates is that political culture, which he considers to be fundamental to making democracy, political culture is not mechanical. It's deeply organic in both time and space. It's made by a number of parts coming together in the right proportion and the right tension. And I'm doing this abstractly now, but you'll see it very concretely in just a little bit. So he understands that political culture is born of particular histories and linked to every other aspect of a nation's fabric. Now, Democracy in America, the book, is also framed by Tocqueville's conviction that comparative political study could be the basis of rich political theory. That comparison is a really, really useful theoretical jumping off point. And this takes us back to the very origins of the word theory. Tell me if you can see way in the back. Can you see these terms? Yeah. Sort of, yes, good, okay. So theory comes from the Greek words theorem and, to, and theros is the Greek word for theorist. And both mean to see a theorist is one who sees. I left out an E right here, sorry. I have to make it big. So it's not like a mathematical theorem. So, so what we get from the ancient Greeks, ancient Athenians actually, is a notion of a theorist initially emerging from travelers, ambassadors to other places who spectated on these other places, other polises, went to other places to see how they conducted their festivals, how they conducted their athletic um, affairs and so forth, or they went to the temple at Delphi, the temple of, of knowledge, to see into the future. So theory's original meaning conjures the notion of traveling in order to see, traveling in order to see. The, its original purpose emerges as a reflection on the theorist's own culture 
by going somewhere else to get a comparative vantage point. And you've all had this experience. Whenever you travel, you, you see home a little bit differently. Whenever you go to some other place quite different from your own, you not only see the new place, however you see it, not objectively, but you see it somehow through the lens of home, but you also see home a little differently. You see your own practices and ways and mores and manners, habits, even politics differently. So theory involves in, in its origin acquiring perspective from a distance, journeying away from one's context in order to see something about one's context that you can't see while immersed in it. Theory also emerges then as, as a way of trying to understand what the future might hold for political life. And that's the importance of those ancient Athenian theorists initially going not just to other polises, but to the temple at Delphi, trying to understand what the future might be. Now, Tocqueville is very much in this tradition of theory as rooted in comparative perspective and traveling in order to see. If you look closely at his, um, the very end of his author's introduction, he tells you quite explicitly, I have tried to see farther than any other party, not just differently. And he also says, I have tried to see not just tomorrow, but the future. He's contrasting immediate predictability with a more broad set of paths that democracy might take in Europe and in France. And I'll just say that what, what Tocqueville is doing then is, is trying to grasp the future, not as a, as, a, as a linear or predictable path, but as a set of open possibilities and dangerous perils. And that's very much shaping what he's doing in thinking about democracy in Europe at this point. What might be its, its future in terms of these possibilities and these perils. And he is treating theory as that which will help us navigate it better. If we, can, if we can get these perils and possibilities mapped, then we might be able, in his view, to better navigate both. I will say that this, this value in, that this belief in the value of comparative analysis for theorizing is one shared by some other theorists in the tradition of political theory, Machiavelli, Montesquieu, and some others, but it, it's not mainstream. For the most part, political theorists attach themselves to some other way of distancing or abstracting themselves from politics. It might be that they attach themselves to science, and you'll see, you see this in Hobbes, we'll see it in Marx, believing that science gives you that abstracting capacity from everyday detail and lets you see more broadly what the principles are and the historical trajectory is of a particular set of political possibilities. So science is another way of abstracting from or getting distance on the immediate. So also is philosophy. You see that in Hegel, in Plato, in a contemporary theorist like Rawls. Or sometimes theorists use more literary devices. You see that in Thomas More, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Tocqueville is using an explicitly comparative modality, and I'm trying to suggest it's a modality you see elsewhere in political theory, but it's not a common modality. Um, it's one we might learn from, and it's one I'll be pushing as, as having many benefits. OK, let me say one last thing by way of introducing the, the general project before we really delve into it, and that has to do with the two volumes. I said there's volume one and there's volume two, and five years separate their writing. A great deal of political experience and reflection also separates their writing, as well as some events unfolding in France. Tocqueville, as you'll see, is at a much greater distance in the second volume from his own enthusiasms about America. In the first volume, he offers us an account of a spirited citizenry, an excited and um, engaged democracy. In the second, there's much more emphasis on a self-involved, 
entrepreneurial and politically apathetic citizenry. In the second volume, there's much more concern with rising tendencies toward despotism within democracy. Indeed, as you'll see, the two volumes are in many ways difficult to reconcile, and they have led many scholars, many readers, to question finally whether there's continuity in the argument. It's one of the things we'll be opening up. Uh, and, and whether or not there's, there's continuity even in the convictions that inform Tocqueville's theoretical enterprise. So the, the way to underscore this is, do we really have one book here or do we really have two? And we'll be returning this to this when we come to the second volume. Okay, let's move on to Tocqueville's historiography. It's a complex one, and let's start with the word historiography in case it's not immediately familiar. There's lots of ways to define historiography, but let's just say for now, it is the way that history is conceived. So it's not just another word for history. It's the way that history is conceived and told. It's also very much about what is taken to be generating history, what's pushing it, what's spiriting it, what's making it move. So what we're going to be looking into now is what Tocqueville takes to be the appropriate ways to understand history and what he takes to be generating or spiriting history. Like so many others of his time, as I suggested in my introductory lecture on Thursday, Tocqueville subscribes to an understanding of history that is forward-moving, progressive. He really understands history to be making a progressive march of some sort. And what we have to ask is, what's the content of this progress? And what's its engine? What's moving history? Let's start with the content. The content we're focused on, of course, is democracy. Tocqueville tells us over and over at the beginning of this work that we are in the age of democracy and that everything in contemporary life, and indeed, he suggests, life for the last 700 years has been pushing toward more and more democratization of the, of, of, of the world, or at least of the Euro-Atlantic world. Sometimes Tocqueville calls this the development of equality of conditions. Sometimes he uses simply the word democracy. So one of the things we shall have to learn is whether he means the same thing by them. Is democracy simply equality of conditions? Or is equality of conditions sort of the presupposition or the precondition for democracy? At the beginning, it's not clear. You just have to kind of swim in that confusion a little bit. What he does tell us very clearly in the introduction to book one is that over the last 700 years of history, and by that he means European history, or sometimes what he tellingly refers to as simply the Christian world. Over the last 700 years of history in the Christian world, there has been a steady growth in equality and democracy. On page 14, the very first full paragraph, he says, we shall scarcely find any great events which did not promote the cause of equality over the past 700 years. So that's page 14, the first full paragraphs. Reading through the pages of our history, we shall scarcely find any great events which did not promote the cause of equality. There has been, in other words, a steady growth in equality and democracy. And then he lists a fascinating collection of what those events are. The next paragraph is an example of the kinds of events that have generated more and more equality of conditions. And these include the Crusades, the English Civil Wars, the introduction of municipal institutions, the invention of firearms, the development of printing and the post, the rise of Protestantism, the discovery of the New World. So every event he can think of 
he understands as contributing to producing more of what he's calling equality of conditions, breaking down rank and hierarchy, breaking down extremes. Most crucial, though, in his accounting is the end of feudal land holdings, large aristocratic land holdings, and the replacement of those land holdings with the free circulation of property. What these things did, in his view, was incite invention and enterprise, and also generate all kinds of new knowledges, themselves very widely distributed. And these, in turn, introduce what Tocqueville calls on page 12, new avenues of power. New avenues of power. What does he mean? What he means is, that there are forms of social power, mercantile, financial, intellectual, that for the first time have materialized as political power. Forms of social power that challenge rank and privilege by birth or by traditional authority and forms of social power that become important in governing society. So what's his point here? His point isn't that, oh, only recently did people start thinking or trading or engaging in commerce, but rather that these have become forms of political and social power in recent centuries in ways that they were not previously. And that they are contending with or contesting the old forms. So what he's looking to is all kinds of ways in which power is taking shape apart from simple rank and nobility and, and, and dominant class form in aristocratic lords and in religious authority. But why has this happened? Why, why these new forms of social power? Why everything adding up to more and more equality of conditions, breaking down the, 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 the monopoly on everything, wealth, privilege, and honor by the few, and the reduction of the many to simply being serfs and peasants. Why has that happened? Here, Tocqueville makes a very interesting turn, namely to God. Let's look at the very bottom of page 14, the last paragraph. And if you don't have your text, just listen, because I shall read to you. Tocqueville says at the bottom of 14, the last paragraph, everywhere we look, the various events of people's lives have turned to the advantage of democracy. All men have helped its progress with their efforts, both those who aimed to further its success and those who never dreamed of supporting it, those who fought on its behalf and those who were its declared opponents. Everyone has been driven willy-nilly along the same road. Everyone has joined the, same, the common cause some despite themselves, others unwittingly, like blind instruments in the hands of God. So whether we meant to or not, whether we were for democracy or against it, we were God's instruments in producing a more democratic world. What in heaven's name is Tocqueville talking about? Let's figure it out. Before he gives us more of an account here, what he tells us is that the engine of this democratic movement is literally God's will. In the last full paragraph on page 15, he says, the effort to halt democracy appears as a struggle against God himself. Nations have to comply with the social state imposed by providence. Sounds a lot like George Bush. Democracy is God's will, and we are bringing it to the rest of the world. But we know that's not what we've got here, so let's keep going. Or maybe we do. God is the mastermind of a master plan. 
No matter what we do so far, this is what we understand. No matter what we think, no matter what we say, this plan of increasing equality, of eroding and corroding rank and hierarchy established by birth, this world of increasing equality of conditions and equality of aspiration is going to unfold because it's God's plan. But then, the tone of the chapter shifts and the place of human knowledge and human agency comes straight to the fore. Tocqueville declares in the paragraph just following the one that we read at the bottom of 15, the very last line on 15, that Christian nations of our day today, and I'm in the very last line of page 15, appear to me to present a frightening spectacle. The change carrying them along is already powerful enough for it to be impossible to stop. Okay, we already know that. We've got this democracy unfolding everywhere. Yet not swift enough for us to despair of bringing it under control. Okay, the us, the humans, have to bring this thing under control. Their destiny, human destiny, is in their own hands, but it will soon slip from their grasp. Now we have a really fascinating formulation. We have this God-given plan of democracy. It, it is exerting tremendous force in making a new world, but it's bringing us to a brink of some kind, an apocalypse or a danger of some kind. And our task, as good Democrats or as good Christians or both, is to get hold of what's going on. In Tocqueville's words, to bring it under control, or as he says a paragraph later, to educate it, to educate democracy, to begin to anticipate its next moves and give these moves proper shape, proper form, proper support. So now we have a picture of democracy not just unfolding everywhere as part of God's plan, but unfolding as a kind of wild thing, a fecund thing, but also a dangerous thing and that our task on earth, and you, you should, any of you who really studied Protestantism, be get, beginning to get the Protestant dimensions of this, our task on earth is to harness and steer it, to give it form. Otherwise, we will be overcome by it, dominated by it, and it actually has the capacity to become monstrous rather than good. So from the beginning, we have in Tocqueville not just a lover of democracy without defining it and stipulating it and forming it and giving it proper shape. If we have from the beginning in Tocqueville an understanding of democracy as having potentials, dark ones as well as magnificent ones, and it is the human task to bring these potentials out. We have to educate and sculpt democracy rather than let it run wild. It is not something that can take care of itself. Another way of seeing this, I reminded you that, that there's an aristocratic mm, dimension to Tocqueville, both in his own upbringing and in his own way of seeing. What we're getting is that aristocratic touch in a naturalistic historical account. Okay, to see more detail here, we need to go further with, um, with uh, Tocqueville's own text. We're going to turn now to page 16, about a third of the way down on page 16. Just after the sentence I've already read to you, a new political science is needed for a totally new world. Tocqueville then says the following, but that is something we scarcely consider. That is, we don't consider developing a new political science. Why? Positioned as we are in the middle of a rapid stream, we stare fixedly at a few ruins we can still see on the shore as the current drags us away backwards toward the abyss. Just an aside for those of you interested in Benjamin, you can hear little connections here between Benjamin's angel screaming, leaning backwards, and this. But let's go back to Tocqueville. What is the picture he's drawing? Most of us don't see what we need to see, which is that we're facing a new world, and we need to get the map of it quickly, and we need to understand what our part is in bringing out its best, because we are, at least the we he's addressing here, and one has to assume it's a literate European audience, mostly rolling backwards 
hanging on, clinging to, or desperately fixed on what we're losing or what's being left behind. So it's an image, a, an image quite literally of, of, of heading for an abyss or falling over a waterfall. Um, because we're faced the wrong way in the stream, we're looking at what's lost or we're looking at what's familiar rather than trying to map the new and navigate it. We're lost because we're facing backwards. We're clinging to or mourning the past. And I'm, I'm suggesting this kind of a statement is clearly addressed, if not to aristocrats, to other anti-liberals or anti-democrats, those who are, are, are wishing for the old regime or at least wishing to be restored to something they know. But then let's keep going. Um, <clears throat> we're still on page 16. He says, in no country in Europe has the great social revolution I've just described made more rapid advances than in France. But this progress has always been haphazard. He continues, never have the heads of state made any advance preparations for it. It's occurred despite them or unknown to them. So he's now also indicting politicians. They also aren't managing democracy well. They're not figuring out where they are. They don't know what time they're in. They're not doing it right, he adds. The most powerful, the most intelligent, the most upright classes of the nation have not made any attempt to take it over so as to control it. Democracy has thus been abandoned to its primitive instincts, to its primitive instincts. The force of history, in other words, has run over people and nations rather than being taken up by them as a subject of opportunity, of knowledge. It's not taken up by them as material to craft or to form or to make their own. So the human agency in this divine plan pertains to our capacity to apprehend where we are and then to shape the conditions by shaping laws, ideas, customs, and mores that are appropriate to the values we have. You can see this in the final passage I want to read, where um, Tocqueville has, has been talking about democracy being abandoned to its primitive instincts and what this leads to. And then at the very bottom of the page, he says, the result is that the democratic revolution has taken place in the fabric of society without anyone's affecting changes in laws, ideas, customs, and manners necessary to make this revolution beneficial. In other words, the democratic revolution has occurred in the body of society, but given no direction or, or understanding by the head, by mind, by power, by governance. It's happened to us, as it were, passively, rather than being enacted by us actively. The other danger that, that Tocqueville's calling our attention to here is that it's happened in a way viscerally, corporally, at the bodily level, rather than being intellectually organized and designed. And you, again, are getting that aristocratic anxiety about, about the about bodily things, desire and passion in public life, running amok in public life, rather than, than political life and social life being orchestrated with care and attention. Now, in the next several pages, what Tocqueville does is detail the horrors of an unfolding democracy without the sculpting and the form giving that he has just called for without this kind of apprehension and intervention, without building correct laws and correct institutions and correct habits. And that's the abyss that he thinks France and the rest of Europe are headed for. What he describes includes new class hatreds, mob rule, but also new and excessive deposits of power in government itself. He also describes rampant but largely impotent destructive passions and interests in political life. These are the things that he thinks ruin democracy or make a ruin of democracy. However, he concludes this 
long exegesis on the disastrous state of European society and politics by turning back to God. And let's now take a quick look at page 22. We are um, at the very bottom of 22, the very last paragraph. After he's given us this long study of all the terrible things that Europe has done by not taking hold of its situation, by looking backwards, by floating down the stream backwards. And he says, am I to believe that the creator made man to leave him struggling endlessly with the intellectual wretchedness that surrounds us? I cannot think so. God is preparing a calmer and more stable future for European societies. I'm unaware of his plans, but I shall never stop believing in them because I cannot fathom them and prefer to mistrust my own intellectual capacities than his justice. In other words, God did not give us democracy to mess it up. God gave us democracy to do it right. Okay, so we don't quite have George Bush. We have something, but we have something a little different. God frames the whole picture. He's unfurling an unstoppable democratic historical force, but he also has a final plan for it. And it's up to human beings to grasp both the nature of the force and what's needed to harness it and what's needed to implement the plan to make a peaceful, stable, active, engaged, democratic order, to give form to this raw material. We have, in short, a kind of collectivized Protestant imperative here. Our task is to do good work on earth to realize God's plan. And in this case, the good work on earth is to realize democracy. But Tocqueville doesn't stop here with his historiography. There are a few more twists introduced by the specific phenomenon of America. And they're going to sound like they're countering what we've just learned. What have we just learned? That democracy left to its primitive instincts runs amok, creates disaster, produces nothing but a mess, ultimately results in despotism, and does not, in fact, realize God's plan. But then he tells us, in America, and this is at the very bottom of, of 23, the top of page 24, democratic revolution, democratic life, took hold simply and easily. As he puts it, that country sees the results of the democratic revolution without experiencing the revolution itself. Didn't have to actually throw off the old regime. Didn't have to smash up the old uh, order of feudal hierarchy. He adds something more. He suggests that democracy in America is the most natural form of democracy. So now we've got a notion of naturalness in democracy contesting with the notion of democracy left to its primitive instincts. And we just have to hold that tension. He's not unaware of what he's doing. What he says is, democracy represents the natural turn, I'm sorry, America represents the natural turn given to the laws by democracy when it's left to its own inclinations. And what he's doing is reaching back in a political theoretical tradition inaugurated by Plato, developed by Aristotle, in which every governmental form has a true and good and realized nature and a deformed version. Each governmental form has a true and good nature and a distorted version. And America has, by happenstance, landed on the true and good nature of democracy. And as he gives us this account, once again, we're going to see the hand of humans recede, and nature and God are going to take over. America, above all, appears as a kind of lucky convergence of things, abetted by God. It's not a humanly crafted and intellectually fathomed order. Remember, the intellectual class is, for, for Tocqueville, mostly absent from America. 
One way to see this is that we have, in a way, certain overtones of a European colonial mentality at work in Tocqueville. What do I mean? Far from the shores of Europe, far from the shores of deep and complicated historical layers of civilization, a new world offers a primitive and uncompromised ideal. An ideal that Europeans can learn from, but they can't really imitate or import wholesale, because European history and European civilization is so much more complicated and extensive. So Europeans, the ones Tocqueville is writing to and for, are going to have to fathom the problem of democracy as material and form to be given to it. They're going to have to fathom that intellectually. They're going to have to deliberately craft institutions. America just does it naturally. So what I'm suggesting is that even while he's praising America, there's a certain European supremacy still being secured here, um, that, that even, even in the praise. Now the final twist he offers in this uh, telling of, of, of the unfolding of democracy comes in the very beginning of chapter two with Tocqueville's argument that an individual like a nation is indelibly marked by circumstances of its birth. As he puts it, the entire man comes fully formed in the wrappings of his cradle. He tells the story of, you know, you think the child is one thing and the adult is another, but if you really look back, you can see who the whole person was going to be there in the cradle. And he says the same is true with nations and civilizations. And now we're getting yet a different notion of destiny from that of the inexorable hand of God. We're getting a more fatalistic or pessimistic notion. This is the melancholic side of Tocqueville coming through, one that neither trusts fully in God nor in human capacity, but sees really only a limited ability to shape ourselves, individually and also collectively. And this strain's going to come through in the book a lot. What we're going to get a lot from him is the sense that America was just really lucky in how it was born. It was born without a revolution. It was born by the Puritans, so it had a good strain of authoritarian religion in it. But it was also born through the spirit of liberty, because that's why the Puritans came, so it had a good spirit of liberty in it. It had certain fortune in the institutions it developed, in the land that it happened to be on, that wasn't very conducive to large aristocratic land holdings and so forth. So we're going to see in Tocqueville, in addition to the belief in provenance, in addition to the belief in progress, in addition to the belief in the hand of God, fulfilled and realized by the act and the apprehension of human beings, we're also going to see this kind of slight mm, providential notion or, 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 or fatalistic notion of, 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 of luck in, and contingency in circumstances. All right, I want to conclude today by turning finally to a beginning of talking about what democracy is for Tocqueville. And I'm not going to get very far. We'll do that in a big way on Thursday. Um, and it's really the question of the next two weeks, what, what democracy is for Tocqueville. But we're just going to start today by, by um, first continuing our understanding of democracy as a force and then turning to two particular elements of it that he emphasizes in the beginning of the book. In considering the question of democracy, we're going to be watching the way the answer of what it is is related to this complex historiography. It's, it's something that unfolds, that is democracy unfolds without our doing anything. And it's also something that has to be crafted, cultured, finely honed. Democracy, he's told us, is a force. It rolls over everything and it takes everything with it. It's like a rushing river. It's also something that's distinctly modern in his view. It's produced through modern revolutions, but it's also been germinating through history for hundreds and hundreds of years. When he considers what it is about America that makes it such a good 
democracy. He emphasizes its unfolding naturally, instinctually, without restraint, and in doing so is also emphasizing the organic quality to democracy. An organic quality that he thinks is fouled in the European experience of suddenly becoming Democrats, because Europe has a past of non-democracy and anti-democracy, because it's overly civilized in a way, and because of the problem of revolution. Revolution for Tocqueville is the opposite of organic emergence. Revolution as a violent cut, a violent change, is exactly the opposite of organic structure and unfolding. All right, so far we have a notion of democracy as natural and right, God-given, the purpose toward which history is moving, yet also something which must be achieved, cultivated, educated, and developed. It's something that's easily distorted and destroyed, and yet it's natural. But it's also delicate, fine-tuned. It's warpable. It's wreckable. To get at what Tocqueville's doing here, let's go now to the elements that found democracy in America. He first talks about this in very concrete material ways. What founds democracy in America? What makes America founded as a democracy? And the first thing he says is, well, those Europeans who left to settle America were comfortable but not high ranking. He calls them middle class. And that, he believes, as when it's the dominant class, leads to democratic sentiments. It's a question, but that's, that's, that's his formulation. Secondly, he tells us, there's no basis in the founding of the New World for a landed aristocracy, for a simple reason. In the wilderness of America, he says, too much labor is required for land hold, large land holdings to be viable, and there's too much available land, so there's no reason for somebody to work somebody else's land if they can just go work their own. So large landed aristocracy just never gets up and going, except in one place, the South, because of slaves. And he's going to spend a lot of time on how the South blows the whole foundation of democracy in the US. And part of that will have to do with the problem of racism, and part of that will have to do with large landholding, aristocratic type classes. OK, so we start in these kind of material ways, middle class types, or at least middling types. It's not really quite right to call them middle class. Um, neither extremely poor nor extremely rich are those who are founding um, European existence in the US. And there's no basis for a large aristocratic uh, land holdings. But then he shifts the register to focus on his true love, the Puritans. What is it about the Puritans that so sends Tocqueville over the moon? What they combined, he tells us, is the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom. After all, they came to the US because they were religiously persecuted, meaning their religion really mattered to them. But they came here in order to be free. In Europe, these two principles, the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom, Tocqueville understands as having been at odds over the last several hundred years. They kept clashing. In the Puritan founding, they're the foundation, the very grounding of American democracy. And this founding for him is more important than the constitutional founding. This original founding for him is what gives American democracy such great foundations. So what is it more precisely that he loves about the Puritans? He says, they were ardent sectarians and fanatical innovators. This tension between being ardent sectarians and fanatical innovators is for him a tension that he thinks is essential to democracy. Can't have just one or the other. 
Why? Because being an ardent sectarian means that there'll be attachment and investment that keeps you really bound to the polity. And yet, they also cherished liberty. And cherishing liberty is crucial to countering any despotical tendencies that a new egalitarian order might generate. OK, let's try to get at this more concretely. What is he saying? First, that spirited by their very deep convictions, their deep religious convictions, the Puritans were also seeking the freedom to practice those religious beliefs. And that freedom infused the whole world of politics that they developed. Second, the Puritans had passionate attachment and devotion to their local ways of life, as well as a deep appreciation of innovation and collective self-making, of producing themselves. They weren't passive. And their deep appreciation of innovation and collective self-making, he refers to as keeping them free from political prejudice. Now, that's an idealization of the Puritans that's quite hi historically false. But he's trying to draw a picture here of something that he thinks is really important, which is this passionate investment and attachment to something that you care about, and at the same time, a commitment to, to uh, a certain kind of political openness or political liberty. Above all, what Tocqueville says is that religious devotion places limits on democratic zeal. It places limits on democratic zeal. Now just suspend whatever, whatever views you have right now of what religion is doing in politics. Religious devotion places limits on democratic zeal. And on the other hand, democratic zeal, democratic passion, belief in equality and liberty, places limits on religious authority. So there's two forces here that are, if not balancing, really kind of contesting and, and, and um, limiting one another. Religious devotion and democratic zeal. And if, if democratic zeal places limits on religious authority, but religious devotion places limits on democratic zeal, you won't have the problem of the excesses of the French Revolution, that kind of uh, just getting carried away with freedom and liberty leading to um, mob, mob rule or mob demands. You can see this, and this is the last place we'll look today, in the final passages on pages 55 and 56. Let me see if we just, yeah, we can do this for a minute. Um, at the very bottom of 55, Tocqueville says about the new democratic sentiments, I'm just at the, at the very bottom. He says, an almost limitless path, a field without horizon, opened before them. The human spirit rushes forward to travel those places. That's democratic zeal. But it stops itself. I'm sorry, that's religious zeal. It stops itself at the limits of the political world and lays aside the use of its most awesome abilities. So religion will put a stop to what democracy will otherwise just keep pursuing limitlessly. Democracy, he knows, is anti-authoritarian. It will kick at authority whenever it gets the chance. It will disturb every settled meaning. It will disturb every settled boundary. That's its creative force, but that's also its destructive spirit. So if it doesn't have limits, it will become disastrous. It will break every bond. It will break every fealty. It will, it, will, it will shake and shatter all governing truths. And those things are, are not viable in a, in a cohesive, stable society. You can see this if you turn the page to 56, the first full paragraph, where he says, in the moral world, religious world, everything's classified, systematized, anticipated, decided beforehand. But in the political world, Everything's in a state of agitation, dispute, and uncertainty. So in the one, religion, passive if voluntary obedience, 
In the other democracy, an independence scornful of experience and eager in its pursuit of authority. Now he goes further, and we don't have time to do this today, but he goes further in arguing rather than just seeing democracy and religion as mm, limiting each other, they actually work beautifully together. He actually thinks that in, at their best, they can blend in such a way that religion respects liberty as the expression of human nobility and human excellence. And freedom, in turn, can see religion as its own essential grounding, its, its guardian. So what do we have? Religion grounds, democracy loosens. This is the essential tension that Tocqueville wants to develop in a vibrant yet stable democracy. The essential tension is between faith and authority on one side and liberty and innovation and agitation on the other. One or the other, without the other, leads, in his view, to a disaster. So what Tocqueville's done is provided a new twist on the early modern theme of the importance of religion to governmental stability. Except now, religion is crucial to a vibrant democracy. He sees them as separate, but essential to one another. He doesn't do what Locke does. John Locke, remember, pulled religion and politics apart by sending religion off to the private sphere and making political life fundamentally about human interests. This is a different move. He doesn't make religion a private matter. Rather, he insists on the value of religious culture for democracy. Religious culture is democracy's ground and limit. All right, let me stop there because it's, we already have just a little bit of time for the logistical things we need to do. As I said, by Thursday we'll have time to actually, um, I think, to actually start asking questions. I'd ask you not to leave. I need to quickly call roll so I can settle the um, enrollment for this class. So I'm going to do that now and remind you as well that we will, um, on Thursday, be doing section switches. All right, can you hear me? So um, <laughs> this room is tricky, as you know, to get into. I don't know who quite thought up the idea of having two auditoriums with a couple hundred students in them each with two tiny entrances at the end of the hallway, but that's modern design. Um, it's kind of like the Bay Bridge reconstruction. But um, we'll do our best to start at 20 of. Um, I, uh, myself, am often at the end of the pack or in the pack, trying to sort of not be too pushy about getting in here. It takes me about five minutes to set up and um, that means for me the best thing to do if you want to talk to me is, is find me right after class. I won't be available today because I have to run for a plane, but normally if you need to work something out with me, I'm totally yours the minute that class is over and we'll just sit outside on the steps and work out whatever we need to work out. Um, I'm, I, I hope you can hear me. The previous instructor walked off with the wireless mic. It happens. Um, he'll discover it in his office, sort of scratch his ear and realize he's got it on. Um, so I'm going to try not to trip today over this one. Um, we need to do a very quick thing on the sections, which I think Nina and Mark are going to explain. We have a total of 162 students here, um, the ones who have been told they can enroll. We still have a wait list, but we have a, we, those who are in are in. Um, but we have uneven sections, um, in a few cases dramatically so. And so uh, Nina is writing on the board what you should do, but um, <clears throat> she's also going to turn around and explain it. 
So we'll do that in the last few minutes at the end of class. Yes. Okay, you know what? Ignore the actual numbers and focus on the times. And then when you get to the point where you're going to actually deal with getting re-enrolled, yes, he brought it to me. It's a gift. It's okay. You know what? It's all right. And I'll do it someday. Thank you. They're all pleased. And there's a backup. And my former days in a garage band taught me how to use the backup. So. How about that? It was not a better life. Okay, so, can you hear me nonetheless? If you need to switch sections, um, if you have a conflict, and after lecture, if you can come to the front of the room, we'll try to get it sorted. Also, if any of you can switch sections and would like to maybe help someone out, um, if your schedule is that flexible, if you can also come to the front of the room, I think that will definitely uh, make things easier for section switches. But we'll get that sorted right out after lecture. Okay, so that means I'm going to try to stop lecture about um, 10 minutes early. No, I'm going to make this one work, I hope. I don't know what to do about the lights, but it may just be we have a day of lights going on and off for no reason that we understand. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's go on with Tocqueville. And then we'll worry about sections and everything else. And if I have to just reach over here and turn on the lights every so often, that's what we'll do. Okay, here we go. Last time, we were beginning to try to understand what democracy is and what democracy isn't. And we were trying to do that by beginning to work through the story that Tocqueville is telling about democracy, and more specifically, about the American founding. So what Tocqueville is going to do is never say, this is what good democracy consists of. He's simply going to build that, that understanding through an unfolding of what it is that he admires in American democracy. And more specifically, he's going to build it through an unfolding that involves kind of taking us through the history, the the settling of it by Puritans, the development of townships, and so forth. At times, he's going to idealize things. He's going to exaggerate things. He's going to tell what we might call today historical untruths or fictions, not because he's committed to lying, but because he's trying to emphasize a principle. So he'll exaggerate here and there, and I'm going to today try to make some notes about things that he's doing to to bring out what he considers to be the true and proper form of democracy um, in ways that sometimes involve a little bit of um, license with the truth. By, in, in talking about democracy, certainly we know that Tocqueville means more than simply a political order inclusive of representative government and civil rights and liberties. If we were to say today, what do we mean when we talk about democracy? We'd say, well, it has to have a universal franchise, there has to be representative government, and there has to be basic rights and liberties. Tocqueville's not there. That's not how he's talking about democracy. It's not that those things are irrelevant or not part of the scene, but they're not fundamental. Rather, what he's emphasized so far is that democracy is a historical force pushing through time and through space, 
in the Euro-Atlantic world producing egalitarianism and uh, egalitarianism everywhere producing challenges to hierarchy and settled authority and producing rank hierarchical rank based on birth or based on religion but he's he's identifying democracy as a historical force that's producing egalitarianism and challenging hierarchy and authority in a broad range of spheres and activities. Democracy for him is not just institutions, it's a political and cultural and social way of life, form of belief, form of activity and associating. It comprises what the French call mentalité, that is a kind of shared attitude or orientation or psychological disposition. And it also comprises a certain kind of being, a certain kind of subject. So we left off in our considerations last time with considering what it was that Tocqueville loved about the Puritans. That was our way into starting to understand what democracy at the political level requires. And he told us the Puritans were ardent sectarians and fanatical innovators, ardent sectarians and fanatical innovators. This tension between sectarianism or, or devotion to, 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 to a polity, to, a, to an organization or to an entity, and innovation, creativity, spirit, this tension he considers essential to democracy. We saw, in particular, that he understood the Puritans, the combination of devotion at a religious level and commitment to liberty, to produce the perfect combination for a good democracy, because religious devotion, we saw, placed limits on democratic zeal. That is to say, religious devotion tempered the tendency in democracy to challenge everything, to turn everything into a matter of equality and individual liberty. And conversely, democratic zeal, he told us, places limits on religious authority. So these two things moderate each other. They suffuse each other at best. They even work synergistically. They work together. As he puts it, the one grounds religious Devotion grounds us. Religious authority grounds us. The other loosens. Commitment to liberty loosens. One grounds, one loosens. So what's Tocqueville after here? He's after democratic passion that doesn't have democratic excess. And we're going to be spotting this excess today. Moreover, he especially likes the fact that the Puritans had a form of religion that treated liberty as the expression of man's nobility, man's excellence. If, if human freedom is understood as fundamental to our making God's work on earth, uh, doing God's work on earth, then religion will tether and channel the freedom that also helps realize certain kinds of religious ends. So freedom won't become rampant individual license, and religion won't simply be unquestioned authority. Now for Tocqueville, this combined spirit of religion and, and freedom that America was lucky enough to have infuses everything about American democracy, or so he says. Again, this is one of those places where he's taking a principle and he's making it the story of American democracy so that we can see why this is so essential to good democracy. So he understands this combined spirit of religion and freedom to infuse American laws, the nature of political participation, the various cultural and social practices that he says make Anglo-American civilization distinct. And this reminds us again that what Tocqueville's trying to do is fathom the whole political culture out of which rich democracy can be born. 
He's not just studying its institutions and laws. He's seen what political cultures can generate certain kinds of institutions and laws and sustain them. Let's come at this question of, of what a properly realized democracy is for Tocqueville just a, a little bit differently. Last time we, we, we considered how Tocqueville's historiography, his way of understanding what moves history and what makes history, how it unfurls or unfolds democracy as a, as a, as a force, the spirit of which is egalitarianism. That is the spirit of the democratizing force rolling over the earth as Tocqueville understands it, is egalitarianism. Now it's important to underscore this because Tocqueville is a great appreciator of what he calls a regulated liberty. But liberty is not the heart of democracy for him. Equality is. Democracy for Tocqueville is above all centered in equality. Liberty is something like a derivative from equality. More about that in a moment. More specifically, this democratic force rolling across the earth for Tocqueville is one he calls equality of conditions. That doesn't mean radical economic or social equality. It means, as we've seen, an order that's not striated by formal rank, by, by, by a political articulation of classes and certain privileges associated with certain classes and certain lack of privileges associated with the masses. Now this emphasis on equality is one end of the liberal democratic emphasis. It's, it's always there when people talk about liberal democracy, they always talk about political equality. But it's not the classic formulation that you get by a thinker like John Locke, who says, above all, what people come together in a social contract for is their individual rights, their individual liberties, their individual claims to property and to rights. It's not even the emphasis that you get in the rights of man formulation. Of course, equality, liberty, fraternity is the slogan of the French Revolution. But Tocqueville's kind of breaking out the equality piece of this as the historical force that is moving the whole thing, that is laying the bedrock for other features of democracy. Indeed, as I said, Tocqueville understands the desire for freedom as deriving from this new equality of conditions. We want to be free because we understand ourselves to be equal with others. It's not to say he doesn't value liberty. He does. But he doesn't think that the egalitarian force he's charting as that which is bringing democracy to the world necessarily produces freedom. He doesn't think that equality automatically generates a free political order. And this is really important to grasp in Tocqueville. It's part of his novelty and genius as a thinker. It's really important because Tocqueville also understands that so-called democracies, places that are equal, that enfranchise everyone, and that have rough equality of conditions at the political and social level, can produce dramatic unfreedom. It's why he can talk about a tyrannical democracy, or an absolutist democracy, or a despotical democracy. This seems oxymoronic, contradictory to our ears, because we, we associate democracy with human rights, democracy with free elections, democracy with freedom. They become synonymous for most of us in the contemporary age. But Tocqueville is different. In fact, he would not, I think, even consider the socialist states of the 20th century to be antithetical to the de democratic force that he's accounting. They too, in their emphasis on egalitarianism, would be part of the force that he's tracking. They'd be an expression of that democratic force that he says is rolling through the ages. So here what we're trying to do is separate out what Tocqueville wants to cultivate as a true and good democracy, the one he's trying to identify in America, from what he takes to be the force producing democratic 
polities, and democratic existence in the first place. Now, in thinking about what democracy is generically and ideally, we need to return one more time to his consideration of what made democracy in America work. We've seen, first, the luck of being founded by the Puritans, where they get the combination of religious fervor and religious authority with a commitment to liberty and independence. But also the luck of being started in New England, where he says there's no possibility, given the nature of the land, to develop a landed aristocracy. You have a middling group, middle class group, who's come and each setting up their own farms or their own enterprises, and you happen to have them in a place where it's very difficult to cultivate large um, domains of land. The third element of luck is that the US, or America, as he puts it, has been founded as a democracy rather than having to engage in revolution to achieve it. And that allows democracy to unfold in some organic fashion. It doesn't have as much to fight. It doesn't have as much to destroy or overcome. He says that keeps it closer to God's plan. Now again, as I said, there's something of a fairy tale quality to this history that, that glosses a great deal of the American founding. What does Tocqueville mean, for example, when he says the poor make the laws in America? And Tocqueville himself will turn back on the story he's told, this idyllic story, when, as you'll see in your reading for next week, he gets to his discussion of the decimation of the Native Americans and the phenomenon of slavery. But again, remember what Tocqueville's presenting is not just a history or ethnography of the US, he's trying to give us a theory of what makes democracy work. He attributes to America what he thinks is essential to it, and sometimes he'll even put in the mouths of Americans his own beliefs. He'll, he'll, he'll develop his ideas through, as it were, fake interviews. But doing this, allows him to develop one of his fundamental beliefs about democracy that shapes the book as a whole, namely the idea that democracy cannot be imposed from the outside. It cannot be achieved through conquest. It cannot be achieved through simply waving an ideological flag that it's the best form of government. Modern democracy in Tocqueville's understanding is made out of the most infinitesimal pieces it's made out of, a, out of a whole bunch of different pieces of a puzzle that have to be fitted together in order for the whole to work. These pieces have to be fit into orders of steadily growing magnitude. They have to be put into proper tension with one another. And by this, I don't mean, as, as, as Tocqueville so often repeats, only that democracy has to be founded in the very habits or beliefs or mores of the people. Rather, I mean every local practice, practices of law, of commerce, of religion, of education, of orientation toward the civic and the public, every local practice has to be organized in a way that promotes democracy at its best. Put another way, modern democracy, unlike the primitive democracies that he'll occasionally allude to, for example, in Native American life, modern democracy is an incredibly complex web of interdependencies and practices and institutions, practices and institutions and interdependencies that are themselves rife with tensions that have to be finely set and finely tuned. Why? in part because of sheer state size, and in part because of what he calls the complexity of modern civilizations. All the requirements of administration, of law, of commerce, and so forth. This size, large states, and this complexity, in Tocqueville's view, are not friends of democracy. So we have an irony. What's clear from the Native American examples that he'll offer 
is that democracy is pretty easy to achieve when there's relatively little at stake, not highly developed industry, homogeneity, face-to-face -face relations. It's much harder when there are substantial resources, which produces a problem of class and self-interest, when there are highly elaborated cultural differences, or as we would say today, race and ethnic and cultural differences, which produces a lack of common understanding and a commonness among the people. When there are social stratifications, again, which keep us from conceiving the nation in common, and when there's vast populations and vast territory, when we don't come into face-to-face -face relations. So here's the irony. In Tocqueville's view, democracy arrives on Earth it, at a time when it's not actually very easy to make work. It arrives on Earth in modernity when things are really starting to get big, complicated, vast, diverse, and that's the time when democracy is really hard to make function. So contrary, again, to the view of many others at his time and to the view of many others today, mass society and a centralized state are not basic elements of democracy. They are its constitutive challenges. They are what make democracy difficult to generate, to maintain, and to keep from losing. Democracy prospers best in small, stateless settings. The town meeting is its model. Or today, we might say the kibbutz, the co-op, the little village, anywhere where you have relatively homogeneous, relatively small political economy, relatively little traffic with outsiders, and have instead um, a face-to-face -face community devoted to its common enterprise, concerned with sustaining freedom and sustaining equality. You can see this appreciation of what is required to make democracy work and what threatens it in the very structure of the book, Democracy in America. He begins with the township. That's the place democracy really works. That's direct democracy, the New England township. This was a place where Americans, in his view, literally practiced democracy in a routine way and also felt all the fealty and loyalty and belonging that keeping democracy nourished requires. This is the place where human beings have access to institutions and to power that govern and shape their lives in common. Thus, Tocqueville says, local institutions, municipal institutions, are to liberty what primary schools are to science. Local institutions are to liberty what primary schools are to science. They put it within the people's reach. They teach people to appreciate its peaceful enjoyment, and they accustom them to make use of it. So what's he telling us here? That people literally get an experience with power, with, with deliberation, with policy making. It's within their reach. It's simple and pretty easy to understand. And you become accustomed to it, accustomed to handling it, negotiating it, making compromises, remaining committed to the whole, and so forth. So on one level, he's setting out the township as the model of democracy. On another level, he's setting it out in America as a school of democracy that will help produce it at the national level. Let's see how this goes. Participation in municipal institutions schools participants in self-legislation and shared governance. But he also says that that participation itself is attractive because it embodies our involvement with power and authority larger than ourselves. 
I'm going to read to you from page 80. If you have your books, you may want to look as well. So this is page 80. It's the spirit of the township in New England. And I am on the first full paragraph on page 80. Tocqueville says, the New England township possesses two advantages which strongly arouse the interests of men, namely independence and authority. He continues in the next paragraph to suggest that men's affections are drawn to this authority. What is he telling us here? That our interest in municipal governments, our, our, com our compulsion to engage in them, exists not just because we want to be self-governing, but because they make us bigger than ourselves. They give us the chance to direct something larger than our own life, to participate in political authority and power. Moreover, though, in directing it, as he makes clear on the rest of this page, we also make it ours. We author it. Hence, our tremendous attachment to it, our fealty. By virtue of participating in it, we become attached to it. We become even more invested in it than we were simply by virtue of living there. And you know this. Anytime you've ever participated in a sort of local government, whether it's a school government or a town government or even just class governance, that you become more engaged, more invested, more concerned with it. And by contrast, Tocqueville tells us at the bottom of the, of the fourth paragraph on page 80, and I'm just now going to quote, once you remove the strength and independence of the township, you reduce the citizens to administrative units. Administrative units, that's the beginning of the death of democracy. When citizens are no longer actively engaged, when they're no longer deeply invested, when they're just administrative units, they become available for despotism. When we are just there to be administered by the state or administered by the law or handled by policy, we are no longer living democracy in the sense of the people governing themselves. Or as another translator rendered this very same sentence I just read, if you take power and independence from a municipality, you have docile subjects, not citizens. Again, docile subjects is the beginning of the death of are the beginning of the death of democracy. Okay, so what do we have? These two ingredients, participation in political power and authority, on the one hand, and a strong sense of fealty or belonging, or what we could call patriotism, as long as we take the my country right or wrong part out of it, as long as we just understand patriotism as real love of patria, real, real devotion to the motherland or the fatherland. So we have on the one hand participation, and on the other hand fealty or belonging or patriotism. These are for, for Tocqueville at the very heart of good democratic character in the individual, and at the very heart of good democratic culture in the group. If you have one without the other, you have a disaster. Why? Participation without loyalty, that is, political engagement without deep investment, without real commitment to the ongoing uh, uh, survival and thriving of the entity, participation without that loyalty to the whole will veer over into self-interest, or it will lead you to throw in the towel when things don't go your way. I lost that vote. I lost that bid. To hell with it. I'm not going to be political anymore. I'm giving up on it. Or if you don't have the loyalty, you'll just go in and see what you can do for yourself, your group, your industry, your people, your family. On the other hand, if you have that loyalty, that commitment to the, to the political entity, or the patria, without participation. It's almost worse for Tocqueville because that's the despotic road. That's the road of blind obedience. That's the my country right or wrong road. 
That's the whatever they say is right. Whatever we are is good. That's the, that's the beginning of the end of thinking and deliberating and engaging. So Tocqueville idealizes the New England township as the only place where these two elements come together harmoniously, where there's participation because there's belonging and love of the township and the town, and where there's love of the town because there's participation. And he turns that combination into a self-conscious principle of American democratic culture and existence. He says, Americans rightly think that patriotism is a sort of religion strengthened by practical service. Patriotism is a sort of religion strengthened by practical service or political participation. This is, again, one of those places where Tocqueville's making a kind of attribution to Americans that's actually his own belief. But let's see another place where he offers this idealization. Let's look on page 82. It's the very end of his discussion of the spirit of the township. Page 82, the last paragraph. The na- this is where, whenever he gets really pastoral and kind of um, does a soliloquy like this, you really, that's, that's your signal to know, okay, this is Tocqueville going into his idealization of a, uh, his, his development of a theoretical principle of democracy, whether it's true about America or not. He says, the native of New England is devoted to his township because of its strength and independence. He is involved because he helps to run it. He loves it for he has nothing to complain about because he's running it. His ambition and future rely upon it. He is engaged in all the happenings of local life. He's comfortable in this confined space. Tell that to Hester Prynne. He is engaged in the government of society. He's accustomed to these procedures without which freedom runs the risk of revolution. He's imbued with their spirit. He acquires a taste for order. He understands the balance of powers and has clear, practical ideas on the nature of his duties and the extent of his rights. So that's his homage to the New England Township as the perfection of direct democracy. Okay, why not just stop here? Why not just say, look, Democracy works at the small, local, homogeneous level. That's the only way to fulfill its ends. Yeah? Uh, I wanted to ask that, uh, do people need the individuals who don't participate on their own are held responsible for their lack of participation? Or are they a result of the despotic or vulnerable society in which they live? So do individuals have a responsibility? It's a great question. And what he's doing in drawing this picture of the New England township is suggesting that there are no shirkers. It's not possible because the township has so cultivated this perfect balance of belonging and participation. So he doesn't give you a moral position to take there. He just is trying to tell you how you produce the culture where the problem that you're raising doesn't even happen. I know that's a not satisfying answer, but that's what you get from Tocqueville right, right now. Down the road, when we start really dealing with his worry about apathy and disinterest and self-interest, he'll give you a much richer answer. Okay, so we have this question. Why, why not just stop here? Why not just say, okay, we get it. That's how you make democracy. Anything else isn't going to work. That is the move that someone like Rousseau flirts with. Um, in, in suggesting that you know, democracy really requires an extremely small um, uh, polity and state, that it needs a fairly homogeneous culture and population and so forth, Tocqueville does not rest here. First, it's simply not feasible to make that argument in the world that he is watching unfold of contemporary commerce, the beginning of what we today call globalization, large nation states with lots of interdependence, such small and isolated units are just going to be mowed down. They, they, they can't exist. Tocqueville is too attuned to the impossibility of having democracy on a small scale 
in the world that he is watching emerge. But there's a second reason. Now that he's given you this glowing portrait of township democracy, he's going to undo it a little bit. Because townships may be democratic, but it's a primitive, unsophisticated, and in some cases he will even suggest kind of ignorant and crude form of democracy. It's not good enough yet. He tells us, for example, that the townships represent the most natural of human assemblies, but that they also entail a certain kind of coarseness and, 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 and generate a certain ignorance, even in dealing with local matters. Thus, for example, he tells us on 72 that there is, I'm just going to read the sentence, there's great difficulty in establishing the independence of the township as its knowledge grows or as civilizational knowledge grows. He goes on, a highly civilized society has little tolerance for the attempt at freedom at the town level and is disgusted by its countless mistakes. What's he describing? He's describing our own view today when some town, even today in the United States, decides to start making its own policies in a way that fly in the face of what are generally accepted positions, even including federal law, and um, starts doing it at a highly local level, we often look over there and say, ah, you know, that's uneducated, it's ignorant, it's reactionary, it's not right. So what's he getting at? He's developing one of those tensions that will be characteristic of modern democracy. Namely, local institutions are essential. They are the school of democracy. They're where we experience power and get a feel for what it means to be invested in something. But not only will they be persistently threatened by all the big powers and forces um, comprising the modern world, they'll also be threatened and perhaps criticized by the sophistication and the expertise that is developing in the modern world. So somehow that tension, that tension between the importance of the local and its limitations, as well as its vulnerability, that tension has to be managed in the architecture of a democracy as a whole. It's why Tocqueville's going to spend so much time not just on the institutions of federalism, but on the culture of federalism, the importance of layers and layers and layers of democratic links through society. It probably wouldn't surprise Tocqueville today that local governments are often the site of reactionary, anti-modernist, anti-enlightenment, even anti-progressive ethos vis-a-vis -vis the sophistication and expertise of the modern world. It's local governments that often try to institute, for example, certain kinds of laws about the acceptability of, let's just offer, you know, prayer in school or um, uh, Christian uh, practices being um, merged with political practices or, other, or simply established um, uh, racially exclusive communities, and so forth. So what Tocqueville's worried about here is the parochialism, the inward-looking conservatism, and often the anti-intellectualism of local practices of democracy, and the anti-worldliness. Those things, he believes, while understandable, will ultimately do democracy no good because those things will ultimately fuel local patriotism, but make a certain kind of mess of governance and of principles of freedom and equality. All right, so let me just uh, try to uh, put in a concise way one tension that we already have in place. Democracy is rooted in municipal institutions, but these institutions have a potentially anti-democratic element in them. They're potentially exclusive, potentially anti-egalitarian, potentially anti-freedom, and they must be drawn into the larger social order in democratic fashion. So we have his pay-ins to the township, 
And then we also have his critique of the township. And what we get from it is, among other things, a recognition that the local is a crucial ingredient for experiencing and experimenting with power, participation, investment, fealty. It's a place where you really feel it, but it won't do. There are going to be lots more of these tensions in the course of Tocqueville's formulation of healthy democracy. That is, for all that he tells us that it's natural, that it's God-given, and so forth, it's not going to turn out to be simple or easy to achieve. Lots and lots of things threaten it, and it has to hold lots of conflicting impulses, lots of conflicting powers. We'll consider a little bit later the variety of forms of power that, that Tocqueville identifies. For now, what I want to do is turn to the points about centralization and decentralization that show us a little bit more about how this problem of the local and the national or the small and the big come together to produce the beginnings of a theory of democracy in Tocqueville. I have to find my water, just give me a second. Okay, so we're on to decentralization. What does Tocqueville know? He knows that democracy must be decentralized for it to be healthy and for liberty to be preserved. But he also knows there's a tendency toward centralization of power and control that is natural to all political entities. He understands that it is the very nature of power to amass to concentrate and to expand. And that, in turn, coincides with the importance of a political entity's capacity for action on its own behalf. What was one of the problems with the townships in terms of being viable, that they can act internally to control certain things, but they can't really act on their own behalf in relationship to large and big powers and forces that might be buffeting them. So. What Tocqueville understands is that not only does power have a natural tendency to concentrate, to amass, and to expand, it also needs to do that in order to be able to, as it were, defend itself, to act on its own behalf. But his recurrent worry in Democracy in America, the book, is this. Without concentrating power in the federal government, without making a legitimate, independent capacity for action at the federal level. The nation cannot defend itself from without. It can't handle internal crises. But at the same time, if there's too much of that, you lose the power of the people. You lose the investment in the whole and the participation in the whole that he was cultivating with such care at the township level. Federative power, then, with strong municipal institutions is, is important, but that just protects general principles. It doesn't yet deal with the question of action. Federative power with strong municipal institutions doesn't solve the question of who's marshalling armies, who's commanding national loyalty, and so forth. So what does Tocqueville do? He has a conceptual solution to this problem of the need for a certain degree of national power and even national loyalty, while at the same time making sure that it's not too concentrated, too centralized. His solution is to divide the centralization problem into two different types, administrative and political. And at first, when you read this, it's pretty hard to track. So I'm going to try to work through it a little bit as the final move in today's lecture. First, what are they? What he calls political centralization pertains mainly to general laws to and to foreign relations. In other words, two things common to us all that matter to us all. 
We need laws by which to live. And we need protection of the entity from without. Administrative power, which he will try to decentralize as much as he can, pertains to particular enterprises, particular problems. For those familiar with Rousseau, and if you're not, don't worry about this, I'm just going to make a reference for those who are. This, this administrative set of concerns is the very thing that Rousseau threw out of the general will. Because he understood that being concerned with particular cases, particular issues, would always corrupt the generality of the general will. So it always needs to be handled by something other than the general will. So let's go back to Tocqueville. When you combine administrative and political power, administrative and political power are both centralized, what he understands is that the power of the state will become truly enormous. And you can see an example of this on page 103, about two-thirds of the way down. Say again. The page is 103. I'm about two-thirds of the way down. He says it's realized that governmental centralization acquires immense power when joined to administrative centralization. Governmental centralization acquires immense power when joined to administrative centralization. In this way, here's the problem, it accustoms men completely and continuously to disregard their own wishes and to obey, not only for once and upon one point, but in every respect and at all times. Thereupon, not only does this power tame them, it also affects their habits, it isolates them, and then submerges them one by one into the mass of the community. Right, this is a really rich paragraph. What is Tocqueville saying here? He's saying, first of all, when you combine these two powers, when you have the administration of the details of social, political, and economic life, combined with general political rules and the defense of the nation, when you have all of those centralized, you not only accustom human beings to obey, but you accustom them to obey at the deepest levels of their being, as he puts it, in every respect and at all times. We become administered animals. And then he says, this power not only tames us, it also affects us at the habitual or, 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 or kind of psychological level. And then what does he say? It isolates them and then submerges them one by one into the mass of the community. What has Tocqueville identified in this passage? That centralized government in a large nation state works against democracy. And not, not for the reasons that the Tea Party is worried about. It's not about taxation. It's not about who's running things. Rather, he's concerned that, first of all, it will command obedience rather than thinking and participating. It accustoms us to being told what to do. It shapes that kind of citizen. He'll add on the next page that it even enervates the people who submit to it. As he puts it, it constantly diminishes their civic spirit. We give up on trying to be participants. We give up on having anything to do with politics. But there's also something new here. There's something genuinely new in Tocqueville's recognition that state power in the age of complex societies doesn't just treat us as a mass. It isolates individuals as particular problems or identities through administration. That's what that last line tells you. It isolates and then drops you into the mass. What does he mean? That simultaneously, administrative power separates and distinguishes individuals. Here, a welfare mother. There, a delinquent student. Over here, somebody in need of an of a, of a agricultural subsidy. Over here, somebody in need of a small business license. It isolates the individual as a case or as a problem or as a subject of administration. 
and at the same time massifies. That isolation combined with massification is the material of despotism. And at its extreme, it's, in Tocqueville's view, the material of, of a kind of despotism that, that is so, um, so total that we will eventually give it the name fascism. So what Tocqueville is describing is administrative power that breaks people into distinct units, distinct identities, distinct problems, and doesn't pull us into anything common or collective. The issues it deals with profoundly individuate us. Again, here, uh, an indigent person in need of state help. Over there, an unemployed person. Over here, someone in need of a particular kind of uh, mortgage bailout or, or a particular kind of tax um, category. But in administering us in this particular way, we are at the same time massified, classified by these categories. And that, for Tocqueville, produces passivity, uniformity, and obliterates the individual. So we're individuated and isolated by this form of centralized administrative power. We're not activated as individuals, as we were in the townships, people who have our hands on power, who participate in our experience, who help shape the making of our common existence. So this is the kind of power centralized administrative power that Tocqueville really dreads. It's absolutely toxic to democracy. Consequently, he insists that America, as he's telling the story, has deep administrative decentralization. That all these practical problems happen at the local level. And that in America, again, this is an idealization, but he's trying to tell you what the proper principles of democracy are. That only, that all the national level deals with is general laws and foreign policy. And that everything else must be decentralized, must be very local. Because then you don't get that massification, that abstract face of bureaucracy. You get localities dealing with particular problems in which we know each other. We know this farmer or that, um, that particular uh, retailer. We know that this grain industry needs such and such. We know that we need to build a new school. We know our detailed problems and we're dealing with it in a face-to-face -face way. We're administering in a way that doesn't engage at that, in that massification plus isolation that breeds despotism, despotism and passivity. He does say, well, you know, the problem with administrative decentralization, when you decentralize everything, there's no consistency. You know, you, things are different in one town from another. There's no smooth social regulation. There's no, as he puts it, perfection of administrative procedures in America. And no priority, he says, given to efficiency. Now, of course, his contrast is France, and any of you who are familiar with the two cultures of of administration and bureaucracy, not only in the 19th century, but even in the present, will have some appreciation of what Tocqueville's trying to get at here. Um, the, the emphasis on, on, on being a kind of rule-bound, administrative, uh, efficient society that he's, that he's chafing against in France. Here's the way he puts it on page 109. The very bottom. One cannot find in, in America uniformity, minute attention to detail, or perfection of administrative procedures, as in France. What one does find is the picture of power, wild perhaps, but full of strength. Life liable to accidents, but also full of striving and activity. So again, you're getting his values here. Power that's a little bit wild, life that's full of striving and activity, the opposite of the passive administered citizen. Okay, but let's finally ask, what of political centralization? What is it exactly? What does it mean to centralize political power? Well, despite Tocqueville's initial effort to distinguish between political and administrative centralization, it turns out that the political is not always altogether separate from the administrative. What he tells us, and this is where you have to pay really close attention, 
is that administrative decentralization produces a particular and important political effect. It decentralizes politics at the level of spirit and involvement. So what he says is, despite the fact that the US has a central government, has constitutionalism, if it decentralizes administrative power, then it disperses politics as action and as belonging. So local participation, local belonging, helps to reduce the distance, the alienation, that humans might otherwise feel toward the national. Okay, so there's a tricky thing that Tocqueville's trying to do here. He's trying to describe a feeling of attachment or belonging that you could have if you are dealing with the effects of laws, the, the implementation of laws, and the implementation of policies at a very local level, rather than having them come, on, come down from on high, what he thinks happens is not only that you get to have that civic spirit and civic engagement, but that you begin to feel more connected to the national. And that's the feeling that he's trying to cultivate in the democratic citizen in a big state. That, remember, is what was missing when we were getting to the tail end of the discussion of the townships. How do you get that sense of being involved and connected and invested when you're a little tiny creature in a great big huge nation with lots of people you don't know? Well, one of the answers that Tocqueville has is that if each person has a stake and a place through local participation and local experiences of the implementation of policy, that each will experience, each will feel himself to be powerful, but also connected to the whole. You attach to the whole with a greater sense of belonging and membership. Let's look at one last passage to get a sense of this. 112. First paragraph on 112. What I admire, what I most admire in America are not the administrative results of decentralization, but the political effects. So note the difference. What I admire isn't the political, isn't the administrative results of decentralization. It doesn't really care how the laws are administered, but the political effects. In the US, the motherland is felt everywhere and is a subject of concern from village to the whole union. The inhabitants care about each of their country's interests as they would their own. They rejoice in the glory of the nation in whose successes they recognize their own contribution and are uplifted. Catch the religious overtones here. We're really being sort of interpolated, brought into uh, a, a world in which we are, we are brothers and sisters, all in this nation together. We recognize our own contribution, we're uplifted, and so we rejoice in the glory of the nation by being connected to it in this way. They're elated by the all-round prosperity from which they benefit. They have for their homeland a feeling much the same as they have for their own families. So we have for the whole of the nation a feeling very similar to what we have for our own families. It's from a sort of self-centeredness that they interest themselves in the welfare of their country. And here Tocqueville is beginning to introduce a theme we're going to talk about at length next week, which is how you connect the self-interest, the self-centeredness that he knows is part of the democratic age with a sense of connection and belonging and care for the whole. How do you reckon with that tension? He knows that democracy produces highly self-interested, highly self-regarding individuals, that it produces, combined with capitalism, creatures who are very much bound up with their own interests, and yet he knows that for democracy to thrive, for a, a, a place to be continued to be governed by the people, for them to remain free and equal and not simply administered, they have to somehow be connected to the whole. And that's what he thinks um, this, this move toward uh, 
decentralization of administration does. Now what's also interesting here is that Tocqueville's developing a theory of modern democracy that relies as much on a subjective orientation, how we feel, as it does on objective institutions. Tocqueville is, is, is developing a theory of, of democracy that depends upon what our attachments are, what our orientations are, what our interests and our affect is. In fact, he knows the people are not really very influential on the governing apparatus of a huge centralized state. He knows that. But their involvement with the nation at the level at which it's possible, the local level, gives us the feeling of belonging. It gives us the feeling of participation that's not actually possible at the large level. And it's this feeling of membership and, and ownership that gives patriotism real substance, but also attenuates what otherwise would be rampant individualism rampant individual license, freedom run amok, and instead keeps it oriented toward a kind of political freedom, a kind of care for the whole. So political centralization is necessary in Tocqueville's view, but it has certain anti-democratic tendencies, and they can be offset by this, this, this generation of a feeling of belonging, of having a stake, and of having an experience with power at the local level. This is in contrast for him to Europe, where he says the European enjoys what he has as a tenant without a feeling of enjoyment, uh, of, of ownership, or any thought of improvement. So he understands, even though the European imagines herself or himself free, they're actually not in any way really participating or engaged with power. They're detached, as he puts it, from their own fate. So we'll be continuing this discussion next time when we turn to federative power. We have just a few minutes finally to, let's see, let me think about this. Realistically, if you need to get to your Thursday 2 o'clock section, what we need to do is do the section switches. So on Tuesday, we will begin taking the final 15 minutes of class always, four questions. But today, what I'm going to do is invite um, Nina and Mark to come down here, and anyone who wants to make a section switch should come here as well. Every undergraduate should have a copy of the essay questions that I passed out last week, but if you don't, this is the, well, just come get them at the end of class. We have some extra copies, or your GSI will have extra copies. Um, but you should have them, and they're due next Tuesday. And your um, GSI can talk to you more about the papers. Okay, so we left off, can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Uh, last time, considering the tension between power's tendency to centralize, that is, Tocqueville thinks it is in the very nature of power to concentrate, to amass, and to expand, so it has a tendency to, to centralize and concentrate. The tension between that tendency and democracy's requirement of decentralization. Now here we should just pause for a second and remember that in Tocqueville, we're always thinking democracy on two different levels. We're always thinking democracy on the one hand as that phenomenon that he describes as the growing democratization of the world or the expansion of equality of conditions, that automatic feature of democracy. And then there's that other sense of democracy, which is democracy realized, democracy that is true and good, democracy that is real democracy. And for Tocqueville, that has very specific dimensions. Those dimensions we explored some last week, we'll continue to explore this week. But it has everything to do with realizing both liberty and equality, with um, participation, with a citizen sense of sharing in power, even if that sharing is mostly at the local level. So there's democracy in the sense that he talks about it at the very beginning of the text, which is that the world is simply becoming 
more democratic, that democracy is a force rolling through history, but it doesn't necessarily add up to what, what he wants to call a good thing, good democracy. It could end up being despotic or tyrannical or something else. And then there's democracy as he's idealizing it in democracy in America in the United States. Okay, so we have a tension between the centralization of power and true democracy's requirement of decentralization. You can't have true democracy without decentralizing power because you have to have citizens with some access to it. They have to have some ability to share in it, to experience it, to participate in it, to make it their own. We watched Tocqueville struggle to finesse this problem last time with the distinction he drew between political decentralization and administrative decentralization. We saw him argue that in the US, and more generally in his theory of democracy, power can amass around general laws and general principles, but must be dispersed when it comes to matters of regulation and administration and implementation. So his solution to keeping power in the hands of the people and more is to allow for the possibility of a national set of laws and principles as well as the national task of foreign policy, but keeping power dispersed for purposes of regulation, implementation, and administration. Now the reason for this for Tocqueville isn't just to keep power in the hands of the people, that's part of it, but it's also to cultivate the very conditions of democratic subjects, of making democratic human beings. People who are not passive, who are not obedient to authority, but are oriented toward self-governance, toward making the laws, the rules by which they live, toward participating in something larger than their own self-interest. And I really am underscoring this point because we need to see in Tocqueville the deep attention that he gives to the making and unmaking of democratic subjects. He does not believe that democracy simply comprises laws, institutions, and elections. He would never buy the idea that democracy is signaled by the presence of elections for representative government or even individual liberties and rights. Rather, democracies are made out of what he considers democratic human material. Human beings who have democratic sensibilities, democratic habits, which means the habits of participating in governing themselves, not just the habit of doing what you want. Democratic sensibilities and habits mean an orientation toward the enormous and really quite taxing practice of collective self-governance, of rule by the people. So Tocqueville's not familiar in the contemporary landscape of what is often signaled by democracy. Democracy to him means much, much more than rights, liberties, and free elections. It means power to the people. It means the people rule. It means the people really do govern. Now they don't do this in an absolute way. As we already know, it's not possible in a large state. It's not possible in the age of mass society and complex and diverse economies and polities. But he gets from Aristotle, from Machiavelli, and from Rousseau a deep appreciation of political regimes being made in the very substance of the human beings who make them up, and not just being about laws and institutions. So centralized power and governance is necessary to a large republic, but it's also the enemy of those democratic sensibilities and habits. Centralized power and governance is essential but it has to be attenuated or balanced or curtailed with something else. Not as conservatives today would have it just to keep government off our backs so we can pursue private enterprise and private liberties, but rather 
centralized power and centralized government has to be contained and balanced and, or, or attenuated and balanced with something else in order to keep the very practice of governing ourselves, of sharing in power, in the hands of the people. Local government and participation is, for him, the answer to this. Now, last time we concentrated on this business of political centralization versus um, administrative decentralization. This time, let me say just a little bit about federative power and federalism more generally as one of Tocqueville's <laughs> solutions to this problem. In his discussion of American federative power, you see Tocqueville constantly wrestling with the importance of concentrating power to address the need for unified concerted action. That is, you've got to have power concentrated in some sovereign form in the federal government in order to be able to engage in unified action and, as he puts it, address the future. And on the other hand, we see him attending to the importance of attenuating the power of central institutions to sustain what he calls the democratic spirit of America. So that already tells you he doesn't think of the federal government as the scene of American democracy. The scene of American democracy is elsewhere. It's wherever the citizens actually have access to power and are governing themselves. Let's look at some examples of this tension in Tocqueville's work. You see the, the tension between the need to concentrate power in the federal government and the need to attenuate that concentration elsewhere on page 141 where Tocqueville introduces the problem of federalism. So let's take a look at that opening. Tocqueville says this. Um, it's the very first paragraph in the section called The Executive Power, page 141. The American legislators, by which he means the lawgivers, the, the, the writers of the Constitution, had a difficult task to fulfill in wishing to create an executive authority dependent upon the majority, yet strong enough to act independently and without restraint within its own sphere. Now just catch the, 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 the oxymorons in this sentence. That is, what Tocqueville's telling us is that those who were founding the republic had to figure out how to create a dependent institution, one that was dependent upon the will of the people, and yet independent. So it has to be both. You have to craft something that is both dependent and independent. He also says it had to be strong enough to act independently without restraint, but only in its own sphere. So again, we have to have something strong enough to act yet keep it contained within its proper sphere. What kind of creature is this? One that is both dependent and independent, strong and yet caged. It is necessarily a creature limited by a number of other forces. These will include Congress, popular opinion, laws, each of which Tocqueville counts as crucial to containing what will otherwise be a force that will, by nature, get out of bounds, by nature, go overboard with its authority and lose its consciousness of dependency, start referring to itself as the decider or as that which protects and um, cares for the nation rather than that which represents the will of the people. So for Tocqueville, for example, even though he considers presidential elections every four years a novelty at the time, to really amount to a moment of national crisis and something that also potentially distracts the president from matters of state and may make the president kind of craven as the president tries to get elected or reelected, he thinks all of these vices are worth it if it rearticulates the dependency of executive power on the people. It's worth having all of these inconveniences. And he'll say the same thing about vetoes and other things that are awkward, clumsy, take up a lot of time, 
may limit or hamstring the ability of a federal government to act, but it's worth it to have that in order to be able to remind federal power that it is, in fact, dependent rather than fully independent, and that, in fact, it has a proper sphere rather than every space open to it. So that's a way you can see this tension in the way he talks about the executive power in federal government. You can also see him elaborate these tensions when he talks about the federal system more generally. He recognizes that this system is one of multiple sovereigns and that multiple sovereigns are at best inconvenient, at worst a simple contradiction in terms. That is, if you have sovereign power, it should be absolute, supreme, nothing else should be able to rival it or be above it. And yet if you have multiple sovereigns, federal, state, local, something's awry. So Tocqueville recognizes that there are all kinds of defects of the multiple sovereign system as he understands federalism. It creates conflicts between sovereigns. It creates conflicts for people themselves. They can have two different kinds of loyalties, one close, one far away, perhaps one strong, one weak. It can also create weak national governments, especially for purposes of defense. If, the, if, if, if all sovereignty is not concentrated in one place. And above all, what Tocqueville says is that the system of federalism is actually a very complicated one. It has all kinds of complexities about jurisdiction, about loyalty, about procedure, about who belongs to what and what belongs to where. And what does he tell us? Democracies actually depend on simplicity to work. Why? Because democracies are about the rule of the people, and most people can only handle simplicity. He says that over and over and over again. So here we have him singing praises to a system that is incredibly complicated, and yet is itself in that complexity somewhat antagonistic to democracy, but for him also essential to it in the modern age. Essential to it, why? You can't give up the, the federal state because that's where we are now. We're in, the, we're in the age of nation states. But you can't give up these other layers of democracy because that's where democracy lives. So he doesn't give up on either the value of central government or on the value of democratic localism and participation and insists that there has to be some way of working all of this out. The answer is, of course, uh, a, a federal system, not just multiple sovereignties, but more specifically a federal system, which he says has huge advantages that are not available if you just go in one direction or the other, national government or cantons and small city-states. What he's also concerned about in these discussions is, of course, democracy's own limitations. And you could say that Federation, in a way, represents something of a non-democratic moment in an effort to explain how democracy works. Where, where you see this is in Tocqueville's account, for example, of the fact that democracy can build strength and loyalty, but it can't deal very well either with immediate contingencies, the need to do something when you're attacked, nor can it deal very well with the future with having the long, large view of what a state may need to undertake or undergo. So a federation can, and, and a federal government can respond both to immediacy and to the future. Another way of putting this is that Tocqueville understands that democracy is pretty well suited to peaceful, stable, relatively unchanging societies. We get together. We decide if we like what we're doing, who we are, our current rules. We may make a little change. That's all it takes. But if there are sustained projects or sustained problems, if there are big challenges, fiscal crises of the state, finance meltdowns, upheavals in the Middle East, if there are big changes, big challenges, democracy is not well suited to this at all. 
And if there is a pace of history that's very rapid, that's hurtling us into some kind of future, he also thinks democracy is not very well suited to this. So at that point, you need what he will call an aristocratic element in government. It's not just that you need executive power. It's not just that you need concentrated power. You need some group of people who are wise and far-seeing and have a sense of what's at stake and themselves aren't preoccupied with their immediate interests and are highly educated. Moreover, Tocqueville also worries that democracies tend to mm, obey or, or relate more to affect, to feeling, than they do to calculations, to logic, and to deep historical knowledge. And he also worries that in democracies, people tend not to give themselves privations or punishments. That is, he tells you over and over again, it's very hard for the people to make themselves sacrifice. So to make him contemporary, we might say that our inability to, say, uh, reverse Proposition 13 in California or to tax ourselves more generally has to do with the presence of the democratic element in um, tax policy. And, or in setting tax law, um, precisely that democratic element that Proposition 13 tried to write into law in a big way. All right, the last thing I want to discuss here is um, the, the kind of question here of democracy and power and whether democracies are despotic or free more generally into the relationship, uh, more, more generally turning on the relationship of how power is handled. We're still in the question of federalism, but I want to talk a little bit about that. That is, Tocqueville talks about the extent to which democracies are despotic or free as turning on the question of whether power is amassed and concentrated or dispersed and disaggregated. If it's amassed and concentrated, we're likely to be headed toward despotism. If it's more dispersed and disaggregated, we're likely to keep democracy alive. Similar point put a little differently. Is power experienced and wielded to some degree by the citizenry itself? Now, with dispersal, Tocqueville means several different things. That is to say, he has several different domains of power in mind. Social, economic, political, and administrative. And here, he will argue not just that it's okay for political power to be centralized, but administrative power to be decentralized. He's also concerned to keep them all pulled apart, to keep them separated, to disperse them across different sites. The danger for Tocqueville is when economic, political, and administrative power come together in one place. It's bad enough when any of them are fully concentrated federally, but if they're all concentrated together, if the state has become the national bank and the um, arbiter of the economy, and indeed even owns large parts of the economy, or at least is holding the debt for it, and if the national government is also the administrator, the regulator, and the site of political law, of, of politics and of law, then you're in trouble. Why? Because there's no possibility of local control, local participation, sharing in power. Again, this is not just a question for Tocqueville of establishing limits on government institutions. It's also a question of keeping power, as he puts it, circulating, moving through the fabric of society by not concentrating it entirely in institutions. Tocqueville re refers to this in democracies as, and I'm quoting him, a gentle, continuous political activity moving through the body politic. A gentle, continuous political activity moving through the body politic. And that, that continuous and gentle political activity is for him the sign that democracies are alive. 
So the task is both to limit and disperse power and to create democratic subjects, subjects who are interested in experiencing or participating in power. Tocqueville knows this isn't easy. He knows, as I said, power has a tendency to concentrate. Large states have a tendency to centralize and alienate their subjects. And that modern subjects have a tendency to look to their own private interests. We haven't gotten to that worry in a big way, but that will also contribute to what he's trying to do here. Modern subjects have a tendency to be concerned with their own private affairs rather than with public ones. So he has to work against all of these tendencies in trying to build a good democracy. And he also has to work against the tendency for national oversight of the whole, the need for national oversight of the whole, to work against democratic tendencies. Again, his solution for some of this is to try to make the uh, national government or federal government as much a scene of aristocracy as democracy. That is, a scene of, of political life occupied by those who are not particularly uh, invested in their private interests, who have a long view, who have concern with the whole. He describes aristocracy at a certain point as equivalent, it's actually page 230, as equivalent to, and I'm quoting him, a firm and enlightened man who never dies. A firm and enlightened man who never dies. Now he insists upon the importance of that element at the national level. So what do we have? Wrapping this section of discussion up. We have a formulation of democracy as existing in the local activities and the local practices and the human beings of a large nation while permitting an aristocratic element a place in the overall and temporally enduring structure of government. So by a good democracy, Tocqueville actually means something like a mixed form. He actually means something like a, a, a form of government that consists of democratization of power and experience and participation at the most local levels and a more aristocratic dimension without aristocratic class power, but a more aristocratic di dimension, wise, enlightenment, uh, wise and enlightened, educated, and detached from personal interests, guiding the whole, providing legislative, judicial, and protective functions, farsightedness and wisdom. A truly good or healthy democracy, then, for Tocqueville, is a very carefully wrought, tightly strung, tension-ridden entity. It wouldn't be if it were just a little state, if it were just a little place, with not much change and not many problems coming from the outside and not much complexity. But in this modern, complicated age of large nation states, of diverse populations, of, of enormous um, wealth generated by a very fast-moving political economy. Tocqueville has to draw a different picture. Modern readers of Tocqueville, then, are constantly forced into confrontation with the question. If Tocqueville has described a modern, healthy democracy as requiring all of these elements and all of these tensions, as demanding decentralization of power and local participation, we have to ask ourselves constantly, do we really have democracy? at least in the sense that Tocqueville means. Now, in addition to democracy's intrinsic needs and intrinsic challenges, there are two particular challenges that are, for the US, in Tocqueville's view, enormous. There are two um, uh, uh, extrinsic things that can threaten it. One is revolution, and the other is deep inequalities or deep heterogeneity in the population. And those can be separate or they can be conjoined, that heterogeneity and those inequalities. America avoids the first problem. He tells us over and over again, it was so lucky, it didn't have to actually 
have a revolution against a class that had for centuries, or, or class system that had for centuries um, dominated it, as is the case in Europe. But it does not avoid the second. It is beset by the problem of heterogeneity in the population and deep inequality as a consequence of slavery and Native American genocide. And we're going to now spend the rest of today looking closely at those problems to figure out why Tocqueville is so profoundly concerned with them. We begin this discussion of slavery and Native American genocide by considering Tocqueville's strange isolation of these things from the rest of the book, his segregation of this problem from the rest of the book. The discussion of race, of Native Americans and African Americans, takes place in the 10th and final chapter of the first volume. He's been pretty much silent on the subject until this moment. He's now and then made a little reference to Southerners and slavery as something that deviates from a story he's otherwise telling, but he hasn't had much in depth to say about it. But it's not only the organization of the text that segregates the topic from the rest of the book. It's even in his very phrasing of the introduction of this matter. And if you look on page 370, you will see how Tocqueville introduces the question of race. So this is chapter 10, the beginning of the last book. He says, the main task I set myself is now performed. I've described to the best of my ability the laws of American democracy, revealed what its customs are. At this point, I could stop. And then he says, there is yet something else in America besides an immense and complete democracy. There's something else in America besides an immense and complete democracy. So that something else turns out to be, among other things, the decimation of Native Americans and slave-based racism. And yet he's described democracy thus far as immense and complete. So the thing he's about to talk about is outside that immense, complete democracy. And we have to figure out in what sense outside. Outside for real, like really outside, or outside and because it's not a scene of democracy and therefore contaminating the insides, or what? Another way of posing this question is to ask, how, how is Tocqueville's omission of this discussion up until this point to be explained? How come he can say, well, we're pretty much done talking about democracy, but now there's something else in America I need to talk about? How do we explain the position of this work in the text and its omission? We can't say Tocqueville didn't say, take race seriously. He did. The analysis that's about to unfold is so detailed, so long, and so dire that it becomes clear after you've read it that this issue, the issue of race, is for Tocqueville the issue that threatens both the union and democracy as a whole. So what other ways what might we approach this to understand it? First of all, it's important to note that this discussion comes right on the heels of a chapter called The Main Causes Tending to Maintain a Democratic Republic in the US. We didn't read that chapter, but what it basically does is discuss all the laws and customs and religious beliefs that maintain democratic institutions. And in particular, it's an account of what is entailed in creating and sustaining a very homogeneous society, a society in which people all feel themselves to be like one another. And it's also an account of why that homogeneity is essential to democracy. No multiculturalist took them. So chapter 10, the one that we're about to dive into, is preceded by a very detailed analysis of why not just the brutality and injustice of founding American racism, 
but also the radical social differences that it's going to produce, the heterogeneity of experiences and practices will be, on his view, disastrous for democracy. Heterogeneity and democracy for him just don't work together. Can't have a people ruling themselves in common if the people do not experience themselves as in common. Then he introduces his discussion of race framed by that background by claiming that America contains what he calls three naturally distinct, almost hostile peoples facing each other on the same soil. And the central subsection of the chapter, chapter 10, the one that we're about to dive into, is thus subtitled, what are the chances that the American Union will last? In other words, he's set up the problem of homogeneity. He's now introduced three hostile, separate, distinct races, and then is leading you toward a discussion of why this is likely to blow up the Union, but also why this is likely to um, endanger democracy itself. He's going to offer a dire set of predictions and worries, both about the splitting of the union and, more importantly, about the permanence of the social problem that slavery will introduce into American democracy even after it's abolished. So this chapter can be read as linked to a discussion of what kind of social fabric democracy has to be cut from, which he thinks racism tarnishes. We'll get to his theory of race in a second. But racism will tarnish that social fabric. And this chapter can be read as a liaison or a connection to the yet unstarted second volume in which democracy, as we'll see um, through the rest of this week, is going to get a far less idealized cast, have a far less bright future than it had in the first. Now finally, before again we dig into the chapter itself, I want you to note the construction of the chapter itself. Two-thirds of it is, dis is devoted to discussing Native Americans and blacks. And then, oddly, it turns to matters of commerce and trade. Now he's told you in the beginning that he's going to deal with a bunch of things that he hasn't been able to deal with that are sort of outside the question of democracy. So one way to understand this is what Tocqueville's doing in this chapter is just stuffing everything into this chapter that he hasn't managed to talk about thus far, sort of like a badly written paper where you've got leftover notes and you had some good ideas and you didn't know where to put them, so you just packed them into the end. But that's not Tocqueville. We know better than that. I want to suggest that these two subjects, the subject of Native Americans and blacks on the one hand and their place in American democracy or outside of it, and on the other hand, commerce and trade are very importantly linked linked as a warning and as a plea. This time a warning and a plea not to France, but to Americans themselves. Tocqueville is convinced that slavery is going to be the death of American democracy. He believes that slavery is not just antithetical to it, which it is, he does believe that, but that it's deeply corrosive of democracy, both where it's practiced and where it isn't both during its prevalence and afterwards. And he is making, in the latter part of this chapter, an economic argument to slave owners and to politicians about why slavery should be brought to a very swift end. He's drawing on a device that he'll elaborate in the second volume, a device he calls self-interest properly understood, where you take basic self-interest and you expand and educate it and make it more democratic. Self-interest that he understands as really good for you and good for the nation. Self-interest that's more farsighted and self-preserving than just greedy, acquisitive kinds of self-interest. Self-interest that's trained but also a little bit manipulated. Tocqueville's going to draw on this device in this chapter to make arguments about the economic disadvantages of slavery in order to make both the slaveholding masters, southerners, and the country as a whole grasp 
the dispensability and even the need to immediately get rid of this institution. Now, just to be clear, <clears throat> Tocqueville, as you know from having read it, has a deep moral objection to slavery. And he has an elaborate analysis of its disastrous effect on democracy. But he knows that self-interested whites are likely to share neither. Neither the moral approbation nor the sort of far-sighted view of what it's doing to democracy. And so he knows they're not likely to be moved by the moral arguments or the far-sighted arguments about democracy. Consider, for example, that in all the virtues Tocqueville ever enumerates in the democratic citizen, and those virtues include love of liberty, love of patria, robust and zealous pursuit of an individual and common good, he never says a Democrat loves justice. He never, ever says that Democrats love justice. They may love liberty. They may love God. They may love country. They may even love equality. But he never says they have a comprehensive moral sense of justice. And he also never claims that Democrats can acquire a deep sense of the conditions that cultivate democracy, that culture democracy. Remember, that was left to the aristocratic sensibility, that educated, far-seeing, wise sensibility. Democrats are inevitably a little more swallowed by self-interest and appetite. They're drawn to power. They like maybe sharing it if they're, if they're cultivated in the right way. But they don't get, by nature, a deep sense of what keeps democracy alive. So what he's going to do in this chapter is appeal to the Democrats' lowest and most cherished object, his material well-being. He's going to try to persuade democracy in America that, that this well-being is adversely effect, affected by the reliance on black slavery. And if he can do that, presumably, Democrats will then want to end that reliance, and the commercial greatness of the U.S. as a whole will also be enhanced by former masters being forced to turn to the marketplace to make a living. Now, the Native American will not fare so well, because the Native American situation has no such apparent economic implications. So there, Tocqueville's going to end much more with laments and with fatalism. It's going to really be a dismal picture, as it has turned out to be indeed in history. He's not going to come up with counsel and strategy. But let me just be clear, we're about to now really enter the discussion, I'm just trying to frame it, that even with slavery, Tocqueville will be addressing slavery, but even there, he's not going to see the end of slavery as the end of the black-white race problem in America. That's going to persist, and that's going to be important in shaping his outlook for the future of democracy. Okay, so we frame the discussion. Let's go into it now. We're going to start on page 371, the first full paragraph. I'm sorry, it's the second full paragraph. The whole argument is here in a nutshell, so just repeat the page. It's, if you don't have your books today, it's page 371. It's the second full paragraph uh, on the second page of, of chapter 10. The men scattered over this area, North America, do not constitute, as in Europe, shoots of the same stock. They reveal from the first viewing three naturally distinct, I might almost say, hostile races. Their education, their law, their origins, even their external features had raised an almost insurmountable barrier between them. Okay, so what's he told us so far? We have three naturally distinct races, with some element yet unspecified of hostility between them. But nature isn't by itself the problem. He's immediately introduced education, law, and origin. Those are the things that are producing the insurmountable barriers. He will later use the larger word, civilization. These are these are humans of different civilizations or of different stages in a world civilization. 
Now, he doesn't mention here conquest, violence, or enslavement, but we'll get there. Now, having emphasized education, law, and origin, it's important to say nature does matter for Tocqueville, not because it gives us the essential nature of the particular subject of different races. He doesn't make that argument. But rather, here nature matters because it operates as a distinguishing mark. The races can tell each other apart. And because Tocqueville himself will at times uh, offer a certain naturalness of character that has to do with a stage of historical development in each of these races. Okay, let's continue our reading just where we left off. We saw their education, law, origins, even their external features raised an almost insurmountable barrier between them. And then he adds, chance has brought them together on the same soil, but has joined them together with no genuine contact so that each race pursues its destiny separately. Chance brought them together, but joined them with no genuine contact. Nothing could be worse for a democracy. What have we just learned about democracy? That you have to actually have engagement with your fellow citizens to deal with things in common in order to keep a democratic spirit alive and in order to produce a democratic sentiment in yourself. So without what we might call shared culture, or what Tocqueville calls a common pursuit, democracy cannot be sustained. There's nothing, if, if you don't share a culture and a common pursuit, there's nothing to pull you out of your self-interested, liberty-bound individuality. There's nothing to bind and connect these groups. And that's why Tocqueville goes over and over and over the importance of shared civilization, shared mores and habits, shared values and beliefs, as the basic ground of democratic life. Now again, just to pause to sort of contrast this with our contemporary view, today we tend to think it's fine to not share all of these things because after all what democracy is about is giving you your individual rights and liberties to go your own way. Tocqueville's making a more strenuous demand on democracy. He's insisting that we have to share a sense of culture and civilization and knowledge and, and values in order to be able to govern together. He's asking for more than just private or individual liberties. Moreover, even today, I think we hit our limit. After all, the huge arguments that are taking place across Europe and across North America today about whether Islam can really be integrated or, associate or assimilated into Euro-Atlantic culture very much turn on this question of do, quote, they share, quote, our culture. And those arguments are especially vehement and overt in Europe today, but they're also taking place on our own land on, uh, in, in, in many different venues. Okay, so democracy by itself for Tocqueville is not a binding force. It doesn't gather us together. It doesn't have a set of principles at its heart that will give a people purpose, direction, Indeed, at the very beginning of volume two, Tocqueville's going to make this problem really explicit. And maybe we'll just take a quick look at um, pages 498, 499. Now, you haven't read it yet, I assume, but um, you will. So we'll just take a quick look at it. It's chapter two, um, the beginning of book two. And um, Tocqueville says this. I'm at the very bottom of the page on 498. Tocqueville says, uh, he's talking about the sources of belief uh, in democratic nations. He says at the bottom of that page, if every man chose to form for himself all his opinions in an isolated pursuit for truth along paths followed by himself alone, it's unlikely that a great number of men would ever come together in any commonly shared belief. But then he continues, it's easy to see no social grouping can prosper without shared beliefs. For without commonly accepted ideas, there's no common action. And without common action, men exist separately, not as a social unit. This 
recognition that there has to be common culture, common beliefs, common ideas, is as old in political theory as Plato, who also knew that democracy, in his view, so thoroughly devolved upon individual interests that it could really easily turn into the worst of all regimes, as he put it, because it's animated by the tyranny of pure desire. It also reaches to a number of other theorists. The point is that for democracy, for Tocqueville, democracy has to be supplemented by, by, by this shared idea or shared culture, shared civilization sense. And what the three races in the US make a wreck of is this sharing. Now let's look back where we were. We were on page 371 and look at the next paragraph as Tocqueville is still introducing the problem. He's told us there are these three races. Each pursues its destiny separately. He says, among these very different men, the first to attract attention, the best educated, the most powerful, the happiest, is the white man, the European, the epitome of man, or in French, man par excellence. In a position inferior to him appear the Negro and the Indian. Now, on one level, Tocqueville simply seems to be expressing the prejudice of the age, colonial prejudice, European prejudice, white prejudice, whatever you want to call it. But on another, there would seem to be some anxiety here and perhaps even a statement that he knows is going to be undone by the story he's about to tell. He tells us that the white European is first in the order of man, what man is really all about, man and his grandness, as if to stave off the indictment of that grandness by the truly horrible story that Tocqueville is about to tell. The horrible story of this white man's treatment of Africans and African Americans and Native Americans that will be violent, oppressive, inhumane, instrumental, and stupid. So it's all of these terrible things on top of which it's not really very um, intelligent for politics or for even just inhabiting the earth. So we're going to see in this chapter this tension in Tocqueville, or vacillation, let's call it, between an account of Native Americans and African Americans that casts them as inherently inferior or uncivilized, and one that's going to treat them simply as the victims of a violent and inhumane regime. People who had perfectly decent ways of life, whose humanity was there, but was crushed by white settlers and slaveholders. So in some ways, one can read this opening statement about the first to attract attention, the best educated, the most powerful, the happiest, etc., as a statement in which Tocqueville knows the question very soon will be, who is the real barbarian? Or what barbarism actually lies beneath ostensibly cultivated cultures and practices. Tocqueville knows this is the question here, and he half admits to that barbarism over and over again, and yet he also keeps pulling back from it and reasserting the civilized grandness of European man. Another way to see this is you kind of can, can discern in Tocqueville uh, a phenomenon that exists in American political consciousness more generally, a phenomenon that oscillates between guilt and justification of this particular moment in American history, between a, a, a vowel of what it is that whites did to Native Americans and African slaves, and a more suppressed recognition that covers the recognition in a kind of naturalized white supremacy a supremacy that blames non-whites for their own condition. All right, let's move into the story first of Native Americans and then of African Americans. And again, remember what we're looking for here. It's not just um, Tocqueville's treatment of race, but also what he's saying about race and democracy. That's the, that's the rabbit that we're chasing. The story of the destruction of Native Americans, Tocqueville tells us, is a story that goes like this. Seduced by... European goods, Native Americans ended up developing certain needs 
without the resources to provide them for themselves. So what happens? They become highly vulnerable and highly exploitable when they were self-sufficient. They were perfectly self-sufficient, but now they have needs that they don't have the ability to realize. Moreover, Tocqueville tells us, Native Americans were so radically dependent upon hunting that they were extremely vulnerable to the mere presence of European settlement, even apart from persecution. As Tocqueville puts it, to drive away their game, which is what the settlements did, is like making our farmers' fields sterile. So Europeans don't literally have to conquer or kill to destroy Native Americans. All they have to do is destroy their livelihood. But most important in determining the question of Native American survival is what Tocqueville calls their relationship to civilization. And here he distinctly means European civilization. On page 382, I'm just citing it, not reading from it, he tells us that Native Americans had only two roads open to them once the Europeans arrived, war or civilization. In other words, he adds, and I'm quoting him, they either had to destroy the Europeans or become their equals. They either had to destroy the Europeans or become their equals. And he says that they waited too long to unite themselves in military resistance to take the first road, to try to destroy the Europeans. So what is the second road that would have been available to them, the civilizing road? Here, Tocqueville tells us, civilization is the result of prolonged social endeavor taking place on the same spot. That's his funny definition of civilization. It's the result of prolonged social endeavor taking place on the same spot. And later on, he adds, men do not form a society simply by recognizing the same leader and obeying the same laws. Certainly, Native Americans do that. Rather, he says, a civilization comes into being only when certain men consider a great many questions from the same point of view and have the same opinions on many subjects and have like thoughts and impressions. Now, one might add here that it would seem that this definition should comprise Native American tribes. Don't, don't most Native American tribes have this kind of consideration of many questions from the same point of view, shared opinions on the same subjects? But here, Tocqueville is true to the colonial mentality that shapes him. He can't see deliberation, thought, and curiosity in the Native American imagination or existence. He can only see something close, closer to mere survival, savagery, barbarism. He says Native Americans are governed only by opinions and habits, not by thought and institutions. He emphasizes their childlike relationship to the future. They don't worry about it. He emphasizes their their lack of appreciation of labor, which they consider, he says, evil and a disgrace. They'll hunt and they'll gather, but they won't actually labor. They're pridefully attached, he says, to hunting and to war. He then likens them to medieval nobles, whom he also characterizes as barbarians. Again, what we're getting here is an unwashed European colonial view but Tocqueville is going to build his theory of what happens to Native Americans on this view. What does he say? They don't want to be civilized. They're too prideful, so they end up being overwhelmed by European civilization. Moreover, he says, because civilization values knowledge and wealth, and they have neither, and they value neither, they end up relegated to the lowest rung. And he adds, when they are touched by civilization, they end up corrupted by it. They're driven back toward barbarism. He says at a certain point, misery drove these unfortunates toward civilization. Now oppression repulses them toward barbarism. In other words, they can't survive well in European civilization, so they run back to the only thing they know. We have here, importantly, a certain theory, very common in the 19th century, of stages in 
development or civilization and of the impossibility of skipping stages of history. This brings us to a really important point about the progress narrative that we talked about at the beginning of our, our consideration of Tocqueville. Tocqueville is here joining his peers in a theory of history that treats barbarism not just as civilization's opposite, but as its predecessor in a historical march toward democracy, freedom, enlightenment, and culture. In other words, barbarism is outside of Western modernity, but it's outside of it because it's prior to it. Barbarians aren't barbarians by nature, and this is important. He's not giving us a naturalistic or essentialist view of the Native American character. He's not, he's not making the, the race into something that can't be civilized. Rather, barbarians are what they are by, by virtue of where they are in an imagined story of a progressive world history, a whole story that comprises the whole world. And I'm emphasizing this because this theory that we see so strongly in Tocqueville will become axiomatic in the 19th century and persist right up into our present. It will justify colonial domination and imperial exploits as civilizing. We're bringing them forward in history. It will also form the basis of cultural narratives in anthropology. It will become the basis of modernization theory in politics and economics. And it will justify Christian missionary work. Today, of course, it very much shapes popular accounts of the Middle East from the perspective of the West, the imagination that the Iraqi people, for example, need to be brought into civilization by our defeat of the barbarian fundamentalists and terrorists and dictators who are pre-modern, who are unwashed by modernity. So all these formulations are based in a belief that the peoples of the world share a common story of development, but are in different places in this story. And the European happens to be at the front, way ahead of the others in their place in the story. So the primitives either need to be developed or, as Tocqueville in his more melancholic way describes it, will be extinguished. So this is why Tocqueville can make that really surprising statement that Native Americans have as much natural genius as Europeans, but as he puts it, nations like men need time to learn. He refers to Native Americans as a young people, childlike, and children in the story of civilization. All right, let's turn now briefly to the story of African Americans. They're not like the Native situation. He treats this situation very differently. He basically tells you Native Americans are going to be wiped out. They're, they're, they're finished. There was no hope. Blacks, by contrast, were brought to America. They weren't living here, and they were brought for one sole purpose, he reminds us. Slavery is the institution which shaped black-white relations. And he adds, and I'm quoting him, the fate of the Negro is linked to that of the European. The two races are bound to each other without mingling. So this analysis runs a different course. He knows the Native Americans are pretty much doomed. By contrast, he believes the presence of blacks in America pretty much dooms the republic to a set of insolvable problems. What are these? The problem isn't simply slavery. Tocqueville hates slavery on every level. It's intrinsically immoral, it corrupts democracy, but the problem he really analyzes astutely is the post-slavery problem. He's pretty sure slavery will eventually come to an end, but what he's concerned with is the problem that America continues to live with today. The race prejudice that he sometimes seems to suggest is inherent, but more often is trying to trace out as the effect of race-based slavery. 
Slavery, he understands, was based on a degradation of Africans that he thinks cannot be overcome because it's rooted in what he calls three prejudices that are themselves ineradicable. These three prejudices he calls the prejudice of the master, the prejudice of race, and the prejudice of the white. So he's just coming at the problem of race prejudice from three different directions, but showing you that they're all imbricated. So slavery is just one problem. Sla Southerners, he believes, are stuck with it for various reasons, and he worries that they're going to cling to it long after they've been given every reason not to. He also worries they'll blow up the union over it. That's why he's, as I suggested at the beginning, desperately trying to argue to them that they should give it up and that they should give it up for economic reasons. But the bigger problem, the really insolvable problem for him, is the legacy that race-based slavery delivers to the republic, the permanent and insurmountable obstacles to democracy that it offers. And it's why he begins the discussion of black-white relations with the statement on page 399, and the statement is this, the most formidable evil threatening the future of the US is the presence of blacks on their soil. The most formidable evil threatening the future of the US is the presence of blacks on their soil. Even after slavery's abolished, he tells us, post-emancipation race relations will be anathema to democratic culture. Now he shows this through enormous attention to the operation of race prejudice in non-slave states, which he points out is stronger than race prejudice is in slave states. It's an old point that Northerners were often more, far more racist than Southerners. And he points out that race prejudice is often strongest in states that never practice slavery. Thus, he remarks on 403, the, in the US, the prejudice rejecting the Negroes seems to increase in proportion to their emancipation. Inequality cuts deep into social customs as it is effaced from the laws. Inequality cuts deep into the social customs, or mores, as it is effaced from the laws. So what's he saying here? that it's these mores or social customs that are really the problem because that's where prejudice will continue to be carried long after it's been eliminated from the legal structure. And it's these social practices and mores, these habits of living differently, of regarding each other hostily and so forth, that will sustain the difference and the distance and the alienation between the two races. And this is what will stand as a permanent counter to democratic culture. This alienation deep in the nation between the races, this, this suspicion and hostility and lack of knowledge and lack of shared culture, this is what makes a wreck of democratic fabric. Now what's interesting in, in Tocqueville's analysis it's not just that he's quite prescient about what um, many contemporaries have argued is the permanence of American racism. It's not just that he recognizes that long after its end, slavery would, would, would remain a really corrupting institution. And it's not even just that he recognizes the way in which white fear and white anxiety about a historically oppressed, recently freed people can end up producing way less fellow feeling rather than more. What's also interesting in Tocqueville's account is that he is <clears throat> offering a certain admission about that democratization that he insists is a force rolling through history. It may be a natural force. That democratization may be a natural force, and there's a, a, a couple of really interesting passages on 403 in this regard, but that force is not harbored naturally within human beings themselves. That is, they may, uh, the force itself, making more and more equality of conditions and producing more and more possibility for democratic life may be natural. But individual humans, in a sense, Tocqueville is saying, are not necessarily natural 
Democrats. That tendency to subordinate others, that tendency to regard others uh, who, are other, who are different from you with hostility or with suspicion is, in his account, it seems to me, quite an undemocratic tendency and one that he's suggesting is also natural. The larger point, and where I'll conclude, is this. Tocqueville's analysis of prejudice based on racial difference and exploitative advantage indicates a view on his part that humans are moved as much by inegalitarian sentiments as they are by egalitarian ones. So the egalitarianism that is coursing through 700 years of history, or let's not call it egalitarianism, the move toward equality of conditions that he says is, has been rolling through history for the last 700 years, producing the present moment in his time of democracy, is not necessarily one that's carried in human beings themselves. We, we might carry on abstractly about equality and its importance, but our practical economic interests and our response to otherness carry us in a very different direction. And that's what's important to get here, that he's describing both a response to otherness and a willingness to exploit others that is at odds with the equality democracy requires. And when our practical economic interests and our response to otherness combine, egalitarianism as a force and a widely shared value is brought to a halt. So wherever economic privilege mixes with racial stratification, equality and hence democracy will be very hard to achieve. That's why all Tocqueville's solutions to the wound of slavery are so dire. He says you really have three choices. You can have the races commingle completely, which is to say intermarry and eliminate racial distinction altogether. Just make one race. Or African Americans can be repatriated to Africa. Or they can be destroyed. He's not advocating any of those. It's really important to see. This is not Tocqueville saying we should do one of these things. He cannot think of a way that America can get over its bad <coughs> racial origins and foundations and sustain democracy. And so his, 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 uh, his vision of a free and equal multiracial America is just not there. He can't see it as a possibility. OK, let me stop there. Let me take your questions about anything in Tocqueville at this point. This is our first chance to actually have 10 minutes of discussion. So um, please don't leave at this moment if you do. I mean, it's not about not wanting you to leave. It's that if you get up and leave, it makes it impossible for other people to hear. So just hang in for 10 minutes, OK? All right, questions. And I'll repeat them if you're up front so other people can hear them. Yeah. Okay, great question. So how do we reconcile in Tocqueville the idea of there being stages that every people is going through, that the Native Americans, for example, are in the childhood of their development, whereas the Europeans are understood to be in the more mature phases of it. How do we reconcile that with a justification of colonial violence or imperial violence? It, wouldn't that be skipping stages? It is a tension in the theory, and many people have tried to use what you've just developed as the, you know, if, if there are stages, don't they each have to be gone through as a way of trying to stem that violence. But others have used it as the basis for, for example, modernization theory to, you know, let's help them along, let's move them along. So what you're going to see is both possibilities always, and you see it today in political science, you know. You can't impose democracy on a people that's not ready for it, or you can't um, blame the North for the immiseration or poverty of the global South. They're just behind us in a different phase. And then you will see others saying, um, we can help. And you, that is, we can help them develop, 
or we can help them become demo Democrats. Um, and then you'll still see yet, yet other people still within that same narrative um, arguing that uh, they, they um, can neither, that, that you have to um, neither impose nor help, but actually just um, sort of seed the ground for, for um, development, but let it happen at its own pace. And Tocqueville's just a mix up of those things. Does that help? Okay. Other thoughts? Yeah, right there. Okay, so what does Tocqueville mean by an aristocratic element? We're so used to thinking of an aristocracy as just rich people on steroids. Um, and Tocqueville's trying to get at something a little different. So your question's great. He's trying to get at the element that he considers to be inherent in a class that doesn't have to worry about its wealth, that is so established as a, 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 a class that it's not having to look to its wealth, it's able to cultivate other things. Education, culture, um, wisdom, action, etc. What you get from the Homeric Greeks, what you get from a class of people who is so secure in its standing and so educated as a result of that standing, um, <laughs> no, not as a result, but also emphasizes education and emphasizes concern with the world. That it won't just go into government in order to secure its power. Now, it's tricky for us to believe in this anymore, but we find perhaps little elements of it in occasionally in political life. Um, it's getting harder, but certainly the, the, the Kennedy family was more or less, uh, you know, it's harder to find other examples, but they, they are often called out as an example of that. Look, they're not in there just feathering their own nest. It, nobody even knows quite what their nest consists of at this point. Like, where did all that money come from and how does it get sustained? Um, the Rockefellers, others, as opposed to those who are investment bankers running Enron or um, small business owners and so forth. So it's a, different, it's, a, it's a different time in part that took those drawing on, but it's also a different sensibility. Now, the irony is that in America, at the time that he's looking at it, the people who have some of that sensibility are southern slave plantation owners. Um, that is precisely what was at stake for some of them in understanding their difference from entrepreneurial kind of crass northerners, that they had this relaxed aristocratic way of life in which they could, some, cultivate a sense of, um, of education and fine refinement and, and, and high culture and so forth. Not that high, but, but Tocqueville doesn't want to look there for, for that possibility. But that's, that's what he's trying to draw on what he considers the emphasis on education and worldliness in the aristocratic class, not in the bourgeoisie. So it's that class difference. Yes? The question is, I said Tocqueville says, um, uh, 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 or in, from Tocqueville we get the idea that a democratic sensibility may care about a lot of things but not necessarily justice in some comprehensive sense. So on whom does the burden fall of, 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 of thinking about justice? Okay, so we're back to that aristocratic sensibility. We're back to the idea of um, legislators and law, and he knows it's not going to work this way in America because the people will also be swayed by, by people who seem like them or look like them. What he's basically asking for is that people with a deeply democratic sensibility, regular folk, be able to recognize that they should have some lawmakers and some leaders who are not like them, who, are, who, who have perhaps more education, more of a longer view, less, of an Im less parochialism, more immediacy, um, or less immediacy of interest. So that's, he's, he's sort of looking there, but he, and he's hoping for it, and he sees it a bit in the Founding Fathers. He sees it a bit in the sort of Hamilton, Jeffersons, Washingtons, and so forth. He especially likes Washington for reasons that aren't entirely clear. But um, 
that, so he sees some of it in them, that, that kind of large view, that large set of concerns about how to balance the interests of the nation and how to um, work with the problem of centralization, decentralization, power, um, and, and localism and so forth. So he sees some of that there. How to keep it going is another question, but that's who he wants to carry that burden. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So if slavery is unjust, there he's really, I think, appealing to everyone. Just recognize, A, the horrible, the immorality of it. B, uh, the, 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 if, if not the immorality of it, then the, the economic failure of it. And there I think it's a wide appeal, but I think it's a, an appeal a pic, particularly that he's trying to make to, to slaveholders and their supporters. Are we at two? We're at two. See you on Thursday. Let me just say a word or two about the papers. Remember, we know that many of you have not written a political theory paper before. We understand that you're trying to figure out what the genre is. You haven't really been told. You've been given a bunch of things not to do on the front of the prompt, um, on, on the front of the topics, but you haven't um, been told precisely how to do it. There are a couple of ideas, so read the front page really, really carefully. That will help you get yourself located. And then let me just give you three or four things that you should keep in mind. One is that each of these topics are really much, much too big for a four-page paper. They could be books. So you are being invited to, to, to really take, a, take a, an angle through or a slice through the question. Don't try to treat it comprehensively. You're, you're not going to be able, for example, on the first one, to deal with every instance in which Tocqueville talks about despotism. That said, you should certainly make sure you read all of the assignments that tell you something about despotism in Tocqueville's mind and, and, and meditate on them. But you won't be able to deal with everything, so don't try. Um, narrow, narrow the question as you see appropriate. And one way to do that, if you like, is to just say you're really going to focus on, say, two passages. And you know, identify those passages early on and, and try to work with what they're saying. Another way to do it is just to talk about a particular, particular aspect, for example, of despotism in a democratic age, a particular thing that, that uh, Tocqueville thinks causes it. Secondly, it really is useful if you can find passages to work with. If you try to stay at a very large level of generality with political theory, um, you'll drive yourself nuts and the reader nuts. It really helps if you can find particular passages in which to locate what you want to argue and what you think the theorist is arguing. And finally, that leads me to the question um, that several people have posed. Are you supposed to be saying what you think about um, Tocqueville's view, or are you supposed to be saying something more like what Tocqueville's view is? The latter, which is to say, you are expected to make an argument about what you think Tocqueville is arguing. And um, that means you're distilling and you're, you're rephrasing. You're, you're trying to say what you think he's doing, for example, with slavery or with despotism or with forms of oppression that don't come from laws or kings. I'm just giving examples from the questions. Um, or you're trying to say what you think Tocqueville mobilizes to deal with self-interest and individualism, to keep us publicly minded or publicly spirited. So you're making an argument about Tocqueville's view. As the course goes along, we'll be inviting you more and more and more to take your own stands. But right now, this is a paper that's really your first exercise in writing about a theorist's arguments. So um, that's why we're not inviting a whole bunch of stuff. Your argument about the theorist's arguments, your argument against the theorist's arguments, all that. It's just a little four-page paper. What we're really looking for is that you um, develop an account of what you think Tocqueville's doing in response to these questions. OK, that's my effort to help you get oriented. Um, any questions? Yes. Yeah. <laughs>
So the reason I said that it's difficult, and you know, in, in some ways I want to take that back, but the reason it's difficult is that, first of all, you'd have to have some sense of how he might be appropriated by different kinds of political positions. And I don't want you going to look up how different people have used Tocqueville. That'll, just, that'll really get you sidetracked. But you'd have to have some sense. And so you have to be able to read him. And I'm going to mark this a little bit today. But you, you'd have to have some sense of that. And then you'd have to be careful not to overlay onto Tocqueville our own political categories. That said, I actually think it's a really fun question. And for example, today when we're talking about political despotism, I'll try to bring out some possibilities. So I'm, I didn't mean to scare you off from it. I just think, you know, if you want a nice, well, there are no nice, safe, easy questions. But if you, if you want to just stay really close to the text, um, that one may be a little harder. But what I would encourage you to do if you want to do number six is find maybe two passages, one that you think could go in one direction and one that you think could go in the other direction. And just let that be the frame for your paper. Don't, don't try to go bigger than that. Does that make sense? Yeah, what about hypothetically using the same one to go Great. All the better. Hypothetically, that's like a really good thing to do. Um, so if you can do that, if you can make the same passage go left and right, magnificent. Do it. Other questions? Please don't fret too much about this paper. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I want you to give it your best. I want you to, you know, you really learn everything you can from Tocqueville. I want you to, um, you know, put your best writing into it and all of the rest of it. But I don't want you to, um, you know, lose. Well, you'll lose some sleep. But I, I don't want you to. I don't want you. To, don't die over this. Okay. It's a paper. Um, the sad thing is, of course. Tocqueville is a theorist who's really relevant to thinking about our time, which is what this last question invites you to do. And most of the questions are pushing you closer to just thinking about what Tocqueville's saying. Um, but that's just because of where he comes in the, in the course. OK, anything else before I give you a final lecture on Tocqueville? Hmm. Hold on, I lost page one. <laughs> page one of my notes. That could be an interesting problem to think about what I would do on page one if I. <sighs> Okay, no page one. Let me think for a second. <laughs> yeah? The question is, is it dangerous that Tocqueville uses only the US and France to draw, draw overarching ideas about democracy? It's a really great question, and it depends on what you mean by dangerous. And, and here's, here's what I'm thinking. Today, we wouldn't let it happen, right? We'd say, you can't do that. You have to be able to think about democracy as a really shifting, protean, changing term. You can't locate it in one history or another. Um, and it's OK to do comparative work. I mean, much comparative politics works in this way. Uh, but don't conclude that that's what democracy is. I think thinking about Tocqueville's time and what Tocqueville's doing, certainly there are limitations to what he's doing. But what he's, what he's after that I think he does manage to pull off is comparing two nations with very different histories, both trying to take on and develop the project of democracy. Certainly it's circumscribed by the West. Certainly, it's circumscribed by just those two histories. But it has so much richness in it that you'd have to say, OK, it has that limitation, but it also has all the riches of having a, a relatively confined experiment. 
But I, I think it's a great question. It's an important question for our time. What would it mean to generalize about democracy on the basis of two Western nations really quite a bit more proximate than they are diverse? And I assume that's what you were getting at. Yeah. A contradiction between liberty and an organic sense of I don't know that I would call it a contradiction. I think for Tocqueville, it's a really important tension. Uh, one, actually, that I'm going to talk about a bit today. I think he uh, is trying to bring out the possibility of having both community and participation in a public good based on community and liberty, <laughs> and keep liberty from running off the scale into the highly individualized, privatistic, libertarian direction, and keep community from being too repressive and too authoritarian. So I think Tocqueville's quite aware of those twin dangers, and he's trying to actually get those two things to modulate each other. Did I get near your question? Okay. All right, now let me make up what I think. It's so funny, you know, I could do this if I had page one in front of me, I could not look at it, but not having it, of course, creates a certain panic, like not having the sheet music. So, let me just think, what was I gonna do? It's up there. It goes like this. <laughs> we have been thinking in Tocqueville about the, the in the first book, the, the question of community, the question of participation, and in doing so, we see a pretty sunny Tocqueville. We see an excitement in the first book about America as the scene of democratic involvement, political liberty turned in the direction of participation. And then in the second book, things get really dark. More and more in American democracy starts to look dangerous. It starts to be the case that Tocqueville uses the word despotism with more and more frequency. And he's not talking about despotism as an alternative to democracy. He's talking about this thing he really means as democratic despotism. Despotism has lots of definitions. I think in Tocqueville's case, he's really talking about a form of power that does not abide by law or a rule, that works fairly arbitrarily, and that works on us as opposed to being something that we participate in and generate ourselves. So despotism is, um, for him, really the opposite of popular sovereignty. It's really the opposite of popular power. He doesn't really talk too much about the possibility of a collective despotism. He's really talking about something that's coming, that's, that's working on us when we become too passive, too individualistic, too preoccupied with our own things, and too willing to submit to being governed by others. And again, for those of you who have read Rousseau, you know this is an important theme in Rousseau as well. So what does Tocqueville take to be the problem, the big problem of equality? The big problem of equality for Tocqueville is that it isolates us. And it's an odd thing to say. That is to say, what Tocqueville worries about with equality is that it separates us from one another. It breaks bonds. It delinks us from one another in a way that aristocracy or the old feudal orders didn't. Aristocracy and the old feudal orders, to Tocqueville tells us constantly, um, keep us all linked together, both linked to our class and linked in a chain. And Equality does the opposite. It breaks us apart. It separates us. It isolates us. It leaves us each to our own resources, our own capacities, and our own interests. At a certain point, he suggests that what aristocracy does is literally link us all in a chain to one another, but also links us to past and future. We know where we've come from. We know what our... What our um, sons and daughters and grandchildren will be doing, and that democracy or equality does the opposite. It breaks us off from the past and future, and it breaks us off 
from one another. So equality, as he describes it, literally breaks bonds. Equality breaks bonds. It breaks bonds between individuals, and it breaks bonds across generations. Now that, for Tocqueville, intensifies a problem we've already talked about, which is the problem of caring for one another and caring for the future that he thinks democracies already have difficulty in generating. Democracy tends to set us loose. It tends to set us loose to our own individual endeavors, and it tends to set us loose into a preoccupation with the present. Instead, what Tocqueville tells us over and over again in that second book is that in democracy, each is for himself. Each is isolated and locked down into the present, cut off from others, and cut off from both past and future. Now, for Tocqueville, this is dangerous on many fronts, not the least of which is, as I said, it paves the way for despotism, where despotism is understood, as I said a minute ago, as something like arbitrary power without a rule, without the rule of law. In book two, part two, just note, not right now, but when you're reviewing, that the discussion of the danger of despotism in egalitarian societies immediately follows the chapter on individualism. So he sets out a chapter on individualism, begins to talk about American individualism, and then immediately starts talking about despotism. Now, individualism is something he thinks is generic in all democracies, but it's what he calls a religion in American democracies. And that's not Tocqueville's own novel idea. That's been often commented on. It's frequently understood as the peculiarity of American democracy, which is to say, if most liberal democracy cherishes individual autonomy to some degree, individualism as a, as a, as a practice and as a um, cult is taken to new heights in the American scene. Again, what Tocqueville tells us in chapter four on the danger, uh, part two, book two, the danger of despotism in egalitarian societies is that equality sets men side by side without a common link, side by side without a common link. They're deeply disconnected from one another. Now, he also tells us that individualism itself does this. So one of the things we're going to want to pursue over the course of today is what the relationship is between individualism and, and equality in that isolating of human beings. And again, just to underscore the point, for Tocqueville, isolation, separation of us is the raw material for despotism. That's how modern despotism works. We're really easy to dominate when we're isolated, when we're not gathered together in some political and social form in which we act in concert. Then he adds, despotism compounds this situation by, as he puts it, raising the barriers to keep men apart. It, and he, he remarks about it this way, it disposes them not to think of their fellows and turns indifference into sort of a public virtue. So we have a very strange brew here. We have individualism as that which we think makes us strong and independent and proud, but, but is, in Tocqueville's understanding, actually the material of the opposite, of our weakness at the social and political level. It's what makes us easy to dominate, easy to manipulate, easy to administer. Modern despotism, in his view, works not through the violent power of a monarch or a military. It works through isolation, massification, and administration. So we'll guess already what Tocqueville's going to offer as the remedy. Somehow we're going to have to, even out of our individualistic condition in democracy, somehow we're going to have to be joined. We're going to have to have some kind of common investment and social solidarity. 
But before we get there, I want to build the problem a little bit, because I've talked at length about individualism as one problem in democracy. A second problem in democracy, one that intensifies the individualistic problem, is interest, especially self-interest. So individualism is, for Tocqueville, in some ways the natural effect of equality, but in some ways also a specific ethos that the Americans have come to cherish, an ethos that is a value-soaked orientation in the culture. But if individualism is an ethos, something we believe in, something that orients us in all of our activities, interest is what animates it. The interest-driven individual is, of course, itself produced by a very specific kind of society or political economy, a competitive capitalist one. This competitive capitalist society, born in the previous century, is, as, as we talked about at the very beginning of this class, is now really picking up speed and intensity in Tocqueville's time. So Tocqueville's problem is he wants liberty and equality in democracy to be turned toward political participation. That's, that's what will keep us free. If we have equality, equal, equal capacity to participate in shaping public life, and if we have liberty as the liberty to participate in shaping the common good, that will keep us free. But in fact, our tendency between individualism and uh, self-interest that itself is nourished by a competitive capitalist society is to use our equality and our liberty in exactly the other direction, to use it for our private interests, our private ambitions, our private pursuits. Let me put the problem a little bit differently. What's the enormous difference between the classical republics that Tocqueville so admires where popular freedom, as it was in ancient Athens or ancient Rome, is turned toward public life. What's the difference between those classical republics and contemporary democracy? The really huge difference, apart from big nation states and mass society, is capitalism and the kinds of subjects and cares that it produces. The classical city-state, that classic Republican city-state, was founded on citizen virtue, love of political freedom, freedom to participate in the political ends and the political powers of the state. It was not founded on individual or private liberty pursued for its own sake, for private ends. The modern nation state, Tocqueville understands, is very much founded on interest, on a love of personal freedom, not public spiritedness, not public mindedness. Now, in America for Tocqueville, this distinction between classical republicanism and the modern possibilities for it the, the question of the potentials for it, that distinction is particularly sharp because the force of capitalism in Tocqueville's reading of America was unleashed without restraint. There's no old, feudal, or aristocratic hangovers in culture, in politics, in values, in education. And with the major exception of slavery in the South, there's no servant class. So, and there's also actually no intellectual or, or cultural tradition, cultivating public-mindedness, attending to the whole. All there is, the only thing he could draw on that can attenuate this tendency toward turning liberty and equality into interest-driven, self-interested, individualistic ends, was that old public-mindedness from the founding or the origin in the townships. Now, Tocqueville really had his eyes open about this problem of uh, 
the way in which liberty turned toward privatistic ends in the US. He claimed to know no country, and I'm quoting him, where the acquisitive drive had taken a stronger hold on the affection of men. Nor does he just limit this to individuals. He knew well that love of money, love of what he sometimes calls the physical pleasures, by which he means material gratification, Satisfaction of wants and ever increasing desire for more, he knew that just pounded through American society, that it produced a whole culture. And remember, for Tocqueville, culture is not separate from politics. It's crucial to producing a political order, to producing a good one or corroding it. Indeed, Tocqueville delivers a picture of the American race for riches in the 1830s that parallels images of the most ruthless insider trading or street hawkers of contraband today. For Tocqueville, this scramble for riches knows no limits, no bounds, and very few scruples. So what's the problem? Interest, as he refers to it here, when it runs amok like this, when everybody's driven by it, by getting ahead, by having material wants satisfied, by having what he calls the physical pleasures, by, by accumulating wealth, when interest runs amok this way, it makes a wreck of Republican political virtue on every level. So let's go through these levels. First of all, it makes the passion for physical gratification and an exclusive preoccupation with the present predominate in the human heart, as he puts it. We're just thinking about our stuff, whether it's big investments or whether it's we have enough money to buy that new iPhone. Secondly, and related, this predominance of interest and preoccupation with accumulating wealth, amassing wealth, and satisfying physical pleasures or material wants turns us away from public affairs it makes us relatively indifferent to the common good as we pursue our own individual good. Third, it corrupts even the concern that does exist with the common good with partiality toward individual interests. When we are thinking about the common, what should we do about the debt, what should we do about um, jobs in America and so forth, what Tocqueville thinks is when we are thinking about those big questions, when we are so bound up with our own individual interests and when the whole culture supports everything about that, we think about the common in a way that is corrupted by our preoccupation with our own individual interests, and that's how the common is brokered. It's not, it's not thought about as a common. It's brokered from a bunch of particular interests. Fourth, he says, it creates a restless ambition in all human beings in which no abundance is ever enough, where we're never sated, and in which all are wearied, as he puts it, by the race for more, and in which state concerns themselves become totally beholden to that problem. The state comes to be that which simply serves the economy and in turn serves the individual interests of individual beings. And finally, he believes it creates a condition for political domination by the power that courses through an administrative state, which is organized to facilitate our individual interests and essentially give us reprieve from having to think about the common. Now, you don't have to memorize all of these. To see them all, you really only have to look at pages 805 and 806, which I want to read now. Um, it's a long passage, but it's probably um, one of the most important in Tocqueville for seeing just what a, um, a kind of, uh, what, what kind of thoughtfulness he has about the danger that he thinks faces democracy. So it's pages 805 and 806. It's part four. I'm going to give you the chapter. It's chapter six of part four of book two. 
um, <laughs> the heading for this list is all the things that um, preoccupation with individual interest and the predominance of self-interest does to Republican virtue, to a concern with the common, to the kind of thing that he thinks you must have if you're really going to stay free in democracy. So here, we're starting to creep up on the two different senses of freedom that, that are coursing through this book. We're free, of course, to pursue our self-interest, but that, for Tocqueville, is not political freedom. So all of the, what this list does is show you all the ways in which individualistic liberty begins to compromise political freedom, that is, a participation in the common and uh, a care for the common. Okay, let me now read to you um, again part four of part of, of book two, chapter two, page 805. He's just described um, despotism a, a, in, in uh, the, the chapter title, I'm sorry, it's chapter six, what sort of despotism democratic nations have to fear. And um, he, he's, He's um, described, a kind of given a sort of sociological view of um, American life preoccupied with interest and says this. Second full paragraph. Thus I think that the type of oppression threatening democracies will not be like anything there has been in the world before. So he's telling you there's some new type of danger emerging in this new order that hasn't existed before. Our contemporaries would not be able to find any example of it in their memories, and I, too, am having difficulty finding a word which will exactly convey the whole idea I have formed. And then he confesses that even though he's been using despotism, he says, the old words, despotism and tyranny, are not suitable. He knows they're old-fashioned, and they conjure a picture of a despot or a tyrant, and that's precisely not what he's talking about. This is a new phenomenon, which I must, therefore, attempt to define, since I can find no name for it. So we're going to have to try to see beyond the vocabulary here to what Tocqueville's trying to describe. I wish to imagine under what new features despotism might appear in the world. I see an innumerable crowd of men, all alike and equal, turned in upon themselves in a restless search for those petty, vulgar pleasures with which they fill their souls. Each of them, living apart, is almost unaware of the destiny of all the rest. His children and personal friends are for him the whole of the human race. As for the remainder of his fellow citizens, he stands alongside them but does not see them. He touches them without feeling them. He exists only in himself and for himself. If he still retains his family circle, at any rate, he may be said to have lost his country. That's just the preface. Now things are going to get really ugly. Above these men stands an immense and protective power, which alone is responsible for looking after their enjoyments and watching over their destiny. And he's referring to the state, but he's not referring just to the state as a regulator. So this is one of those passages where you could, apropos of your earlier question, really see both the left and right appropriations of Tocqueville. This is precisely one of those passages. That doesn't, just because I'm going to read it doesn't mean you can't write about it. Above these men stands an immense and protective power which alone is responsible for looking after their enjoyments and watching over their destiny. It's an absolute, meticulous, ordered, provident, and kindly disposed. That is, it's not a brutal state power. It's not a police power not even overtly violent. Maybe, but not in this modality. It would be like a fatherly authority if fatherlike its aim were to prepare men for manhood, but it seeks only to keep them in perpetual childhood. It prefers its citizens to enjoy themselves, provided they have only enjoyment in mind. Go shop. Go buy. Go, go, go indulge yourself. It works readily for their happiness, but it wishes only to be the provider and judge of it. It provides their security, anticipates and guarantees their needs, supplies their pleasures, directs their principal concerns, manages their industry, regulates their estates, divides their inheritances. Why can it not remove from them entirely the bother of thinking and the troubles of life? And here, he's referring, you know, not to the bother of thinking and the troubles of life in your own tiny sphere, but anything beyond it, anything that has to do with the political, the social, the human, 
beyond your own small sphere. Thus, here's one of those interesting sentences, it reduces daily the value and frequency of the exercise of free choice. Of course, you're free, and you think you're making free choice all the time, but he says it reduces daily the value and frequency of the exercise of free choice. It restricts the activity of free will within a narrower range and gradually removes autonomy itself from each citizen. Now note, he doesn't say autonomy from each individual. It's, it's citizen autonomy that is vanishing. Equality, he adds, has prepared men for all this, inclining them to tolerate all these things and even see them as a blessing. Okay, we're going to read a little more. Thus the ruling power, having taken each citizen one by one into its powerful grasp, having molded him to its liking, spreads its arms over the whole of society, covering the surface of social life with a network of petty, complicated, detailed, and uniform rules, all the laws of public administration, etc., through which even the most original minds and energetic of spirits cannot reach the light in order to rise above the crowd. It doesn't break men's wills, but it does soften, bend, and control them. Rarely does it force men to act, but it constantly opposes what actions they perform. It does not destroy the start of anything, but stand in its way, and so forth. And then he says, finally, it inhibits, represses, drains, snuffs out, dulls so much effort that finally it reduces each nation to nothing more than a flock of timid, hardworking animals with the government as shepherd. Now here, of course, he could be describing what we decry as a... As, as, um, uh, state socialism, or he could be describing what we praise as entrepreneurial capitalist democracy, or both. He concludes, or where I'm going to conclude, I've always believed that this type of organized, gentle, peaceful enslavement just described could link up more easily than imagined with some of the external forms of freedom. So you could have all the freedoms in the world of, in, the sort of, in the sense of personal liberty and all your um, rights with some of the external forms of freedom and that it would not be impossible for it to take hold in the very shadow of the sovereignty of the people. So we could imagine that we have democracy, popular sovereignty, civil liberties, a bill of rights, and so forth. And what he's describing is, in his view, the gentle despotism that takes hold, takes, takes um, its grip here in this kind of a setting. Okay, so where are we? What Tocqueville is calling equality. I am also suggesting has to be continuously continuously inscribed by us, his readers, with an appreciation of something that he can't quite bring out, namely an appreciation of the capitalist society that is organizing it. He told us that the circulation of property, the breakup of primogeniture, the, the, the distribution of property widely across society, the end of aristocratic forms, he told us that was its origin. Remember way back at the beginning of the book, that was one of the really important incitations of this new equality in the world. And that's in part the link we are seeking between egalitarianism and individualism. That is, it's a really historically specific link. It's a very specific kind of equality that Tocqueville is talking about. Tocqueville relentlessly links equality with individualism. You can see this at the very beginning of book two, chapter one, part four. Um, it's page seven, 775. I'm just going to read one sentence. Equality, which makes men independent of one another, makes us independent of one another, persuades them to adopt the liking for following their own persuasion when it comes to their private affairs. So equality makes us independent and persuades us to a kind of privatistic set of ends. But that's not generic equality. Equality as such doesn't do that. That is the very specific equality of emerging capitalist societies. 
That is an equality that breaks us apart, gives us each our capacity to pursue our individual endeavors and um, to rise and fall according to those capacities and powers. What is also illuminated by appreciating the extent to which Tocqueville is really wrestling with a backdrop of capitalism for the kind of equality that he's talking about. What's also illuminated here are those strange passages in which he claims that Americans can never get enough equality. He says, our desire for it is boundless. He says, there's a level of liberty that satisfies. But on page 624, he says, men will never establish an equality that will content them. Page 625, he adds, the desire for equality becomes more insatiable as equality extends to all. What could he be talking about? Actually, at some point, you should review these passages on 624 and 625, because you, you really see this kind of um, insatiability about equality that he says, we just don't have about liberty. But we get enough freedom, we're OK. What I think he's really describing is not just the longing for equality, more and more equality, but the longing for the capacity to get ahead in an intensely competitive order, where one does not succeed merely by being equal to others, but by bettering them, by, by triumphing over them. But Tocqueville, though he comes close to this point, can't quite theorize it. He keeps calling equality what is actually a dog-eat-dog -dog competitive market culture. He keeps treating equality, political equality, that is the equality that, that emerges when you, when you put an official end to a class structure that the arist aristocratic aristocracy had, where some have certain privileges that others don't. He keeps treating political equality as itself generating a striving, an anxiety, a restlessness, a self-interest. But these are actually the effect of capitalism, not egalitarianism as such. And that brings us to a really crucial point about Tocqueville. He has practically no language for capitalism. He has practically no language for the social power, the organizing force that it is, even though it becomes the most important backdrop of the second book. Capitalism is quite literally not part of his political vocabulary in democracy in America. But it lurches about in his political theoretical consciousness as a constant problem and as a constant danger to democracy. So for Tocqueville, what we call capitalism and democracy are not twins. They are at best uneasy cohabitants and at times even dangers to one another. He has a critique of the implications of commercial society for democracy. That he can talk about. He doesn't see them as easily compatible. But he has no critique of capitalism as such. He doesn't even have a word for it, though he does write about socialism. Instead, the language he gives us is the language of self-interest, individualism, and materialism, or what he calls our love of physical pleasures. Moreover, he certainly doesn't articulate class or, or the domination in capitalism, and he can't quite see what it does to politics, except through this vocabulary of the withdrawn and self-absorbed individual and the, the restless desire for more, the privatistic pursuits that Americans in the second book of Democracy in America seem engaged with rather than public uh, participation and cares. Okay. So that's the problem that I wanted to get at in number one. And now we're going to go to what counters it, what, what, what helps Tocqueville help us out of this problem. And remember, with Tocqueville, we've always got this thing going on where 
he is ascribing to America some of the things that he thinks are necessary to make democracy work. So at one moment, things look very dark, and the next minute he's saying, oh, but here's the distinctly American solution to the problem. And part of that is the political theorist trying to bring out what would be the solution um, and finding it perhaps in some of his sociological materials on America, but perhaps also um, making it a bit hyperbolic, exaggerating it. Okay. So the first solution to the problem of market society for democracy is what he calls self-interest properly understood. And there's a chapter by that name, volume two, part two, chapter eight. Now the interesting thing about the chapter on this topic is that Tocqueville describes uh, self-interest properly understood as the American philosophy. And he describes it as an important attenuating factor in or against self-interest run amok. But he never tells us exactly what it is or exactly how it's achieved. In fact, both here and in chapter 14 of volume two, part two, he concludes on a kind of magical note. Like, I don't know quite how they pull this off, but they do. What we do learn about self-interest properly understood is that it attenuates raw self-interest. And it does this by producing or entailing small sacrifices. As he puts it, educating desire and developing a kind of discipline so that we don't just become bottomlessly craving materialistic animals. Later on, we'll see Max Weber explain this as the Protestant ethic that disciplines sheer egoism into a more specific um, capitalist ethic of saving and preserving and investing. But with Tocqueville, what we have is a kind of substitution of foresight and educated understanding at times for immediate gratification, a kind of harnessing of individual interest or ambition, but we don't know quite where it's coming from. Indeed, we have a sense that when Tocqueville calls it the American philosophy, he's being a little bit humorous, because uh, it's not much of a philosophy and he doesn't develop its philosophical entailments. Regardless, to the extent that he believes it's really here, he is thankful for its moderating effect on raw individualism and interest. So I encourage you to look back at those chapters, but now what I want to suggest is that even self-interest properly understood doesn't yet point us in a political direction. It doesn't yet make us retake the political sphere as the sphere that is properly the popular one, one that belongs to the people if they're going to remain free. So now we need to turn to that second solution, Republican freedom, something we've talked about in passing many times, and now have to bring front and center. Republican freedom, or liberty, is what Tocqueville also means by political liberty, where the accent mark is really on political, the liberty to participate in and engage with the public realm, political life, being self-legislating. Importantly then, it's not mere rights or license. It's not private liberty to do as one wants. He accepts that private liberty. He knows that comes with the territory of democracy. Of course human beings will want to be free once they're equal. Of course, he says, equality of condition generates the demand for liberty. You wouldn't want anyone telling you what to do if you didn't think they were your superior. So once there is equality of condition, once we are all abstractly equal, equal before the law, then there will be that individual liberty. But that individual liberty, private liberty, the liberty to do what one wants, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, hardly functions as a break on self-interest. Quite the contrary. 
So what do we have? Well, again, we have Tocqueville working in an old Republican tradition, and it's important to remember the root of the term, res publica, the public thing, the thing we have in common, the republic, as opposed to a private thing or an owned thing or a thing that is simply for a part, a, a, a group, rather than the public. So it's important here, when he's talking about Republican liberty, to throw out of your heads the, again, just as we had to do with liberalism, the contemporary meanings that we associate with Republican and liberal, and think of Republican not as conservative or not as bound to values having to do with either free enterprise or Christianity or anything else, but rather its original etymological and practical sense of caring for the common, participating in the common, being part of the public, the, 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 the government, the state, the political entity being a public thing, one that belongs to all of us. So political liberty in a Republican tradition or sense is concerned with the practice of ruling ourselves in common, legislating for ourselves in common, and caring for the common. It concerns, therefore, something larger than ourselves. It's not just about bringing our individual interests into government or political life. It is about participating in guiding, directing, legislating for owning the public. And Tocqueville tells us again and again and again, political liberty, this Republican liberty, is the great salvation of American egalitarianism with the deadly offshoots we've just been talking about, individualism and self-interest. At the very bottom of 592, just one sentence, so I'll read it. He says, the Americans have exploited political liberty to combat the individualism born of equality and have overcome it. So, what happened in that sentence? Americans have exploited political liberty to, yeah, 592, to combat the individualism born of equality and have overcome it. They've, they've prevailed. And then he tells you in the very next passage after that one that political liberty is not just an orientation toward public life. It cultivates a recognition of mutual dependence among us and it cultivates the capacity to act in concert. It cultivates a recognition of our mutual dependence, exactly what egalitarianism blows up. Remember, we're all isolated and individualistic and all imagining ourselves on our own, in our autonomous spheres, taking care of ourselves. And it cultivates the capacity to act in concert. That's the other thing that he says, egalitarianism busts apart. Here's how he concludes this discussion at the very bottom of page 593. Bottom of 593. Local freedoms, then, which induce a great number of citizens to value the affection of their neighbors, bring men constantly into contact with one, each other and force them to help one another in spite of the instincts which separate them. So freedom in this political sense is what brings us in contact with one another, literally, reads that kind of collective uh, cons uh, uh, capacity to act together in spite of all the forces that are pulling us apart. Political liberty accomplishes some other things as well. It produces a level of sacrifice that even self-interest properly understood can't achieve. As he says on uh, 594, I've seen Americans make great sacrifices for the common good. Great sacrifices for the common good. Secondly, in addition to introducing a level of sacrifice that's very hard to get out of us otherwise, it gives us, he says, a taste for freedom as action that helps resist that tendency toward despotic encroachments of state. That long passage I read before where we're easy to, um, to have as despotic subjects because we're all just preoccupied with our own material pleasures. If we rise up, and if we rise up together, 
to participate in our collective life, in, in the values and the laws and the orientations that govern us, then despotism is out the window. And finally, along with religion, he says, it pr uh, political liberty produces a counter to that terrible danger of mass public opinion that he worries about so much in this book. You know, he inaugurates the second book with a discussion of the problem of ideas and opinions. And he knows that individualism entails a kind of conceit, a conceit that we're all independent thinkers, that we all think for ourselves, that we have what he calls intellectual liberty. But in fact, he knows that individualism tends to generate the opposite that it tends to produce what he calls a new slavery in democracy based on thoughtlessness, a tendency to follow the mass, and to generalize about particulars. And this is one of those moments where it's just really easy to think about the contemporary American scene. He says a new slavery is possible in democracy based on thoughtlessness, a tendency to follow the mass, and to generalize about things that actually need to be considered in their complexity and their detail. Consider all the reasons that he lists in, in Volume 2, Chapter 3, for the move to generalization, which he considers to be a disaster. It's his code for an unnuanced, unphilosophical attitude toward all the important things in life and a failure to appreciate complexity. He says, Americans discover common rules for everything. They avoid intellectual difficulty. They tend to live by simple mottos and prejudices. And then he adds that democracy itself, equality, tends to make us think more and more alike. Even though we think we're all thinking for ourselves, it makes us tend to trust the mass. It makes us vulnerable to believe um, uh, public opinion, and he says public opinion effectively in, in, in democracies that um, don't have some counter to it become mistress of the world. And the trust in public opinion, he says, stands in stark contrast to the growing complexity of political life itself. That's exactly what misapprehends things. We come up with these really simple, stupid, general ideas about political life when in fact political life is getting more and more complicated and demands more and more appreciation of that complexity and nuance. Yet, he says, trust in public opinion becomes a sort of religion of democracy and overwhelms the alternative. I'm just going to read really briefly to you from page 502. He says, in equality, in, in, in the world of equality, I see two tendencies. One which leads every man's thought into new paths, and another which would force him willingly to cease thinking at all. One turns each man's attention to new thoughts, while the other induces him freely to giving up thinking at all. And he calls this giving up of thoughtfulness a new face of slavery. OK, so what do we have? We now have the other side of individualism, which is not really individual at all. It adds up to a certain uniformity and mass submission to ignorance. That's Tocqueville's really big indictment of American individualism. It adds up to public opinion without basis in education or deliberation or real comprehension of complexity and detail. It adds up to what he would probably say is both produced and expressed in public opinion polls today, from right to left. But if Tocqueville regards public opinion of this sort as a mighty force coursing through the social fabric, a recipe for our domination, political liberty is a crucial counter here. Because it requires involvement with all the difficult and detailed matters of common life, to actually engage in the political world, to really engage beyond our own little tiny universe, is to begin to encounter that complexity that slogans, mottos, and ignorance won't suffice to take us, uh, to, to, to help us negotiate. 
OK, concretely, how is political liberty expressed in, in Tocqueville's understanding? Again, those municipal institutions, participation at the local level, but also political engagement at the national level. And by that, he means being informed and participating in all of um, the, the political issues that preoccupy us at the national level. And finally, Tocqueville's great love through associations. Associations are Tocqueville's passion, and many people call them his unique contribution to political theory. I think there are many more unique contributions than that. But it's worth noting that immediately following the chapter on political liberty is his chapter on civil and political associations. He loves them. He loves that Americans love them. He loves that Americans love associations of every kind, even those that some people might consider subversive. He thinks of America as the land of civic associations, political associations, whatever they are. They're all a moment in overcoming self-interestedness, material acquisitiveness, and individualism in order to make some civic project or common pursuit. So he calls these associations schools in political liberty, because they're all that practice of overcoming self-interestedness and materialism with some common endeavor. Of course, one would have to ask here, what would Tocqueville make of contemporary American political life and associations in which most Americans are both indifferent to politics or contemptuous of it, and in which most of our associations tend to be interest groups of one kind or another, advancing material interests or private goods. OK, one final note on Tocqueville's wrestle with individualism, and then I'm going to give you just five minutes on number three. Despite these instruments for attenuating individualism discussed in book two, there still remains a huge difference between the ardently activist communitarian protagonist of book one, that, that township critter who is always busily participating in public life and is bound by liberty and religion to be the perfect Democrat, and the protagonist of book two, who is more solipsistic, self-regarding, materialistic, and politically apathetic. Our question which we won't solve, is how to read this. Is Tocqueville just more honest five years after his tour of America? Is he, is he less interested in painting a democratic ideal, more willing to render the truth? Or does he have a different motivation in the two works? Different warnings, perhaps aiming more at warning America than aiming France in the second book. Some have said the first book is really written to France, the second is really written to America. There's other possibilities. There's no easy answer. One possibility is certainly that Tocqueville really did see both sides of this America that he's describing and saw them both even in the same people and doesn't quite know what to make of the split. Anyway, I just raised that issue so that you can remember that you have attention in these two books. And now I want to, in just a couple of minutes, talk about women. We're going to be talking about gender and race and colonialism in almost every text that we study, not because, as some students have said in my evaluations in the past, I'm preoccupied with those issues, um, but rather because these theorists are preoccupied with these issues. This is the 19th century. These are happening questions. And to read Tocqueville, Marx, Mill, um, who else are we reading? The, uh, Freud, Nietzsche, Weber, without seeing these issues as central is actually only to read a small piece of them. So yes, it does make sense to me that we would treat, as it were, the other half of the species. But for Tocqueville, you actually get to see something really crucial about his political theory by turning to those chapters on women. What Tocqueville does with women is integrally related to his political theory. It, women will turn out to be a crucial supplement to republicanism as important as political liberty and self-interest properly understood in modulating self-interest and, and, and passion uh, for material things in men. 
But before we get there, we need to first consider this. On one level, what Tocqueville does with women is absolutely typical in political theory generally, modern political theory in, 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 in particular. He exhibits his most contradictory and confused thinking here. He's rather conventional. He's rather unwilling to interrogate conventional norms. He alternates between three different positions. Women aren't inferior, just different. Women aren't unequal, just separate, separate sphere, separate virtue, separate activity. And women are inferior, hence unequal. Most importantly, Tocqueville cannot think about women without thinking about sex. I mean it. He, he, he starts talking about women, and he's immediately on to the question of marriage, chastity, sexual mores, and so forth. He can barely utter the word women without an immediate discussion of whether or not the, the women he's talking about have their sexuality controlled or not, violated or not, honored or not. And he can't stay very long on other topics, women's intelligence, their eligibility for work, their status in the unfolding of democracy without reverting to sex. So he might, as we say today, have sex on the brain when it comes to women. But you're going to see this in other thinkers. It's not unique to Tocqueville. Marx, Engels, even Mill, despite his efforts, certainly Nietzsche and Freud. That's, that's where they're going to go when they start talking about women. But they're also going to talk about other things. So we need to keep all that in mind. The truly typical moment in Tocqueville, though, comes in the instrumentalist or functionalist account of women's place in democracy. He tells us on page 699, I'm not going to read any quotations now, we're just going to move quickly through the argument, that Americans regard women and men as equal in worth, though their lot in life is different. Similarly, he says, women, women and men have different uses for their virtues, courage, understanding, and intelligence, but they have the same amount of each, according to the Americans. And he concludes that, and I'm quoting him, <clears throat> I think it's on 699, that Americans have rightly done everything to raise women morally and intellectually to the level of man, while allowing the social inferiority of women to continue. And he seems to approve of that. So in what does women's inferiority reside? Well, he can't really give an argument from nature. Instead, it turns on the spheres and activities assigned to women. Spheres and activities assigned to women. And what's interesting is that while he could see slavery as conventional, as, as, as something that was um, produced by convention, not by nature, and then see it as something to interrogate, he doesn't do this with women. What exactly is it that American women are providing in the way of a supplement, or what I'm going to call a moral infrastructure for democracy, that would be challenged if they were to be liberated, if they weren't to be kept in what he calls a socially inferior position? Here we have to think about what Tocqueville says women in America restrain or contain in their men. And what they contain or restrain is a tendency toward rapaciousness and savagery, but also a tendency toward unleashed ambition and irreligiousness, and a tendency to act on desire and immediacy rather than have an eye to the future. Okay. So, they're, so, so men are naturally rapacious, ambitious and irreligious, and impetuous. They act on desire rather than with an eye to the future. Now, all these things we have just been thinking about also in relationship to nascent capitalist society. That is, these are the things that, that a, a competitive capitalist order is stirring up, and they're also, in Tocqueville's mind, really terrible for democracy. They're bad even for its stability, but they're also bad for producing a politically free, participatory, egalitarian order. So what have women got that, in Tocqueville's view, tames or tempers this? Well, Tocqueville tells you several things. First, women, he says, are naturally more religious than men. 
Religion, he thinks, is sometimes powerless to restrain men directly, but, quoting him, it reigns supreme in the souls of women, and it's women who shape mores, or social customs. So women are more religious, they shape mores and social customs, they can contain and constrain men to be more uh, comporting with religious mores. Secondly, he says women are less ambitious and less riven to material things. Tell that to the makers of Desperate Housewives. Okay. <laughs> he says men are driven by their passions, especially the passion for wealth, whereas women's desires, quoting him, seem to contract with their fortune as easily as they expand. So women have a moderation and an ability to accommodate that tames or civilizes male ambition a little bit. Okay, so they're naturally more religious, and they themselves help produce the social mores that keep the, the, the climate of the self-sacrifice and submission to authority that we need in religion to go with political liberty. Women are also less ambitious, less bound to material things. They moderate that in men. Third, he says they're future-oriented in the best sense, and here he goes to mating behavior. That is, he, he understands gendered sexual passion as working really differently between men and women. He says men are just driven by their desires, but women, if they're allowed to choose, will choose with an eye to the future. It's that old, you know, women choosing what makes a good mate and men just going for what looks good. And what he's suggesting here is that this future orientation helps shape a future orientation in the democracy as a whole that's missing from that competitive, capitalist, materialistic, insatiable desire cultivated by um, that order. Finally, women's natural submissiveness to husband and family turns out to be really crucial to making the whole order work. Why? Because you can't have a whole population of self-interested, ambitious, highly sexed creatures. There's no basis among those creatures for the essential bonds there's no domain of self-restraint and self-sacrifice. There's no domain of selfless care for others. You can't build a family on principles of individualism. Hence Tocqueville's account of women's willing suffering on the frontier, what he calls her sad and resolute demeanor as she stays by her husband through thick and thin. So what do we have? Women turn out to be yet a third corrective, along with self-interest properly understood and, and political liberty or republican freedom, to the excesses and dangers of democracy. They temper self-interest with their religiosity and moderation, with their own selflessness vis-a-vis -vis their husbands. But this is only so if they don't become like them, if they're not emancipated. And here we need to note that this palliative that women offer, this moderating influence that women offer, can't be provided just by any women. It can't be provided, for example, in Tocqueville's understanding, by European, especially French women, or the women of the revolution, passionate, ambitious, immodest, clamoring for freedom and equality. It can't be provided by feminists, and it can't be provided by aristocratic women, women caught up in certain kinds of class heirs, and it can't be provided by women caught up in feminine and girlish desires. Tocqueville's democratic women, those who crucially supplement democracy or are an antidote to the toxins to democracy, are tough and no-nonsense and hardworking and austere and intelligent and pretty much sexless. That's the woman of the frontier, he's in such, or of the New England Puritan town that he's in so much admiration of. Now, whether he actually sees them this way or whether this is the figure he's drawing of an ideal order isn't easy to determine. It's an old trope in Republican theory. You see it in Plato, you see it in Rousseau, you see it in others. But now, in thinking about Tocqueville's rationalization and instrumentalization of women's subordination, of course, he could have treated slavery in the same way. He could have said, well, some must be slaves so others can be free. Other theorists have said as much. 
He could have rendered slavery as a supplement to democracy rather than anathema to it. My point is that when we think about what's circulating, the abolitionism and the early feminism that Tocqueville is encountering, and we try to make sense of his response to each, it's important to see that he's building a political theory here in which he sees slavery as pure danger to democracy, but he also sees feminism as pure danger to democracy, and he draws a figure of gender and gender relations that he thinks makes democracy work. So I'm trying to suggest that if you just characterize Tocqueville as a, as a mildly racist abolitionist or as a raging sexist, that's not gonna tell you very much. If you position his thinking in relationship about these issues in relationship to his larger democratic thinking, you'll see more. Now my watch says it's four minutes of two. Am I wrong? Do we? 158. We have time for two questions. Sit tight. I'm sure there are some. Yes. Shh. Sorry? Yeah. Right. So he's always talking about how it's important that American women are chaste and that their sexuality is controlled and that they're not flaunting it and that they're not putting on a lot of airs about it. So he, I'm saying he's always talking, whether he's talking about their sexuality in a contained and controlled way or whether he's talking about it um, in some other way. He's always talking about them in sexual terms. One more question. Yes, is that a, that's a hand, oh no, that's a, somebody putting away their iPod. Go ahead. <laughs> Great. So the, the question is for Tocqueville, how different is the despotism that he's seen at the tail end of the revolution? Do you mean the terror in particular? How different is that from the kind of despotism he's trying to describe in America? Great question. Couldn't be more different because there, he's actually seen the overt attempt with people who have faces, who are direct, trying to seize control of society and suppress it. And what he's interested in is where you don't see the faces and you don't see that effort at control and you don't see overt repression. You just live by somebody else running the show, controlling everything that's significant about life. All the major powers in life are out of your control, and all you care about is your own individual choices. They're, they're, it's worse because, in a way, you, you're much less likely to fight it, but it's why he, can't, he needs a better name for that second thing, but he doesn't have it yet. 